ladies and gentlemen, to MBR, or as we like to call it around here, Nothing But Rants, the show where I find topics that I'm oddly passionate about, and I pontificate upon them. These are not hot takes, but rather takes that I'm hot about. Let's shut up and grab some tape. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome in to the Film Guy Network on a fabulous Thursday evening. We got a great one for you, as we typically do here on the network. Uh, we got a saying around here. Okay, we do a lot of content. We do a, we do a lot of content, more than I think any other network probably in the space, okay? And we have a saying every Thursday before we kick off this last two hours of the week. Hey, last show, best show. Lead with the facts, finish with the embellishment. Finish with the flair. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and I feel weird, feel weird giving talking points to a guy like Deion Sanders, but that's what we're gonna do with regards to like managing, uh, you know, kind of your PR, managing what people think about you, managing what people are talking about you. I feel really goofy giving Deion Sanders tips and points and, and, and you know, thoughts on his, uh, you know, recent actions, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, he's in the news as of late, and it's really nothing major. In fact, it's not a talking point at all. It wouldn't be a talking point if, like I said, he just either left it alone or just came out with the facts first and left off the embellishment or left off the typical prime flair that we always get but we got that prime flair um Deion sanders was recently accused in a local beat reporting article gentlemen of not going out on the trail enough okay not being out in in specifically in home visits okay not going to see high school football recruits in their house enough that was the allegation made in a recent article again in the local beat reporting and instead of just coming out and saying hey man like we don't really be recruiting high school kids, so we don't really have to go out here and recruit high school kids and go to their houses. We're a big transfer portal based, uh, you know, organization and operation. Had he just led with that, it kind of would have been a very moot point. But that's not what he did. Instead, he came out here um, and did the prime thing. And again, I feel really goofy because this is prime. This is who he is. But I think we open ourselves to unnecessary and unwanted like criticism and people going to Twitter and talking about you when you are a three or four win, five win football team trying to be a six, seven, eight win football team, right? There's no reason for people to talk about you unnecessarily like they are now because you didn't lead with the facts, you led with the embellishments, okay? And here were the embellishments. This is an article coming from Dan Morrison of On3. While speaking to the media for spring, Sanders brought up the report unprompted and addressed why it is that he doesn't make visits and doesn't think he should start making visits quote let me address something else that i need to address i don't know who did it i don't know if they're in here if you are you can raise your hand like we are in a nursery and we said here there was an article that came out that said i don't go on visits my approach is totally different than many coaches i'm a businessman and as well so i try to save our university money every darn chance i get so for me to go let's say i go to florida and i'm visiting whatever school img you don't think those coaches are going to get a little upset if i don't come by the school down the street you don't think it's going to be pandemonium or i'm going to get naysayed if i don't go to an uh, uh don't go another 45 minutes then if i go to that one why don't i come to that school now this coach is mad and he's not going to let the kid come because i chose that school over that school see other coaches can do that but i can't i can't do that so basically he's saying like hey man i, I cause pandemonium when i not when i when i'm out on the recruiting trail if i go see img academy and i don't go see the other high schools everybody's mad at me well that wasn't really what the talking point was about right i'm not asking you to go out on the recruiting trail during may during high school you know practices in fact you're not allowed to in fact head head football coaches have to sit at home during that time that's not what i'm asking that's not what the the article was talking about what the article was talking about was hey in-home visits towards the end of these cycles dion doesn't go finish dion doesn't go to these houses and see these kids and again they sound like five high school kids last class. It's a moot point at, at Colorado. They don't do these things. You don't take in-home visits for transfer portal kids, which is something he brings up three and a half minutes into his actual uh, speech here about this article that he wanted to, to defy, right? That was a little counter towards the truth. 
The truth is, they don't recruit high school kids. The truth is not, I can't go to IMG Academy because uh, Bradenton, Florida kids get mad at me. Or I can't go to this school because it's going to be pandemonium when I show up. That's not the case. It's not the case at all. The case is you don't recruit high school kids. Just start with that. You don't have to talk about how, you know, they don't, you, you don't want to go see their house. They want to see, they want to come see your house. Like we don't have to do all that stuff. Every time we do all that stuff, we open ourselves up to people talking about us in a negative light when all we have to do is say, hey, stupid article, I don't recruit high school kids. So of course I'm not going out on in-home visits to finish high school recruitments. Hmm. Welcome in, by the way, boys. Thank you. He- I- it's it's a, it's the Dion thing that he continues to do with his program. It just kind of how he talks about himself and not necessarily getting to the true facts of everything and just beating around the bush a little bit, maybe adding a little too much flash instead of saying exactly what you just said of let's just come out and say the facts. He picked the weirdest way to answer that question. I, yeah. I don't understand why you would come out and say – well, I'm just too important of a person to do in-home visits that yeah. if I do go do this, everyone else is going to be upset. You don't think people are more excited to have Kirby Smart or Nick Saban when he was there coming to your school as opposed to Deion Sanders? As big of a deal as Coach Prime is, as exciting as it is, Colorado is a four-win football team that was playing in prior to now a Pac-12 conference. Like The idea that Deion Sanders comes to town the entire world stops just seems a little arrogant to me. But I mean, it is Coach Prime, so what do you expect? This one right here, I've done, I've pretty much, I've pretty much, I've pretty much done a personal survey. If I told you I pretty much did the work coming into the show, do you feel confident that I did the work coming into the show? No, probably not. I've pretty much done a personal survey. I really and truly in all my heart believe that parents don't want me at their house. They want to see how I live, how I get down, see what I got going on, what God has done in my life. I know when I was in college, I did not want Bobby Bowden in my house because I knew after seven o'clock there were going to be rats and roaches on parade doing their thing, which I get. I get I have personal experience right there, right? He coming from, uh, you know, his own personal experience talking about I didn't want Bobby Bowden in my house because I didn't have we didn't have our house in order. I wanted to go see what Bobby Bowden was doing, but he's, you know, I mean, isn't in home visits kind of. <laughs> Kind of more so, maybe not for the player, but more so for the parents to kind of right. to kind of get a feel for the coach and like seeing what they're like outside of their own environment. How are they going to behave in my home? And so that's why I feel like it's kind of a moot point. Again. And look, bro, like the elite of elite high school football recruiters in this world, they are finishers and flippers in these in home visits. Mm-hmm. It's the only, it's really the only time that you get to go meet those parents on their grounds, right? As a head coach. As a head coach, you get all these recruits coming on you know, visits to your school and you get to show them around your whole business. That's what they do the entire cycle. That last in-home visit, that last December cycle where head coaches can go to these places, they should be going, okay? They should be going. Unless, of course, like Prime, I think they signed 32 kids this last year. 25 of them were from the portal. You're not going to go see those kids in-house. I understand that. He is 100% right there. But again, A, I don't think this article needed to be addressed in the middle of a press conference. It was off rip. He starts the press conference with, hey, who wrote this bullshit? You know? Like, why? Why are you? You're prime, right? You're prime. You're, you're Deion Sanders. You don't need to address this stuff. And even if you do, address it with the truth first, not the embellishments first. The truth is... We don't recruit high school kids. But again, this is Deion Sanders. Deion Sanders has always been flash first, facts second, right? And the facts will ultimately get there. I don't believe this guy to be a liar. I don't believe this guy to be stupid. I don't believe this guy to not be planned in accordance, right? This is exactly what this guy is. He is tactic or he is flare first, tactics second. And the flare is part of the tactics. <laughs> this freaking fly. We got one <laughs> fly in the studio and it's going to kill me, my ADD head ass. I mean, they die after like two days, right? I don't know. What do you got on this Dion story? This is, I mean, this is no different. This is the the quintessential prime for for attention stuff that he did just recently saying that his son would have been the second quarterback drafted in this draft. Like what? Well, I think that one thing he's kind of forgetting too is like when it comes to these in-home visits is it, it's not only a great way for you to kind of show off your personality to the parents and the kids, but it, it gives you a better understanding of where your player is coming from. Like where did they grow up? How has their life been at home? What is their home life like? And that only enhances your ability to coach them at the next level, to have a better understanding of the players that you're bringing into their pro into your program. So it, it's only an advantage to yourself to go and do those things. So it, it's just a little puzzling to me. How about the, we, we're saving the, the school money. You like that one? 
I saw Weird. I saw a Reddit uh, like tinfoil hat theory that he had it written into his contract that any recruiting bu budget that was saved got rolled over into his deal. <laughs> and that would be hilarious if he was out here doing the whole, we're just trying to save money, which every dollar he saves goes into his pocket. Mm -hmm. That would be, it wouldn't be funny, but it, it would be prime. You know it'd, be, I mean? it'd be on par. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think that to be the case. Like I said, no. I think that was a, a classic Reddit tinfoil hat. Ha, ha, ha. Look at these guys. Hmm. I, now I'm interested, like if he does ever start doing in-home visits, like, how would you perceive that as a rec as a recruit? Like, if you're the next, I must be important. Yeah, that or like, is he? Does he actually care about being here? Or you could perceive it that mm. way too. If like, it, did if someone just finally force his hand? Like, buddy, we got to get out there. Like, one, you, you got to go do these things. One thing I know, it ain't about time, right? It, ain't, it, it isn't about him not being able to have time to do so. Because I don't know about you. Every time I turn around, I see Prime. I see Prime at uh, you know, doing different NFL draft stuff. I see Prime. Uh, he was in Dallas a couple weeks back. I see Prime uh, on, on my Madden game when I turn it on. He's texting my little superstar player all of a sudden. Like Prime is everywhere, always has been. So don't tell me it ain't about time. It's about again, just say the facts. The facts are we don't recruit high school kids. So mm -hmm. stop asking. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Deion Sanders is a master of getting people to talk about him. Exhibit A is right now. We're, we're talking about what he said, but I don't understand why you'd want press in this type of scenario. Like, he obviously said that to get a rise out of the public and to get people talking about, oh, my God, did you see what oh, Deion Sanders Oh, like I said, said, it's a moot point if he doesn't open his press conference with it exactly. like yesterday. But, but, like, what's what's the tactic? What's the advantage here of letting us talk to talk about why you don't do in-home visits or to try to criticize? I mean... Being publicized right now isn't necessarily something you need if you're Colorado. I think Dion's only plan with this was to make sure that that reporter knows that he was reading, that you're not just going to talk shit about me without confronting you. Yeah. I think that's the only purpose is to do that. But the, again, if you listen to the – it's four and a half minutes. Four and a half minutes for him to come to the conclusion of we don't recruit high school kids, and the first four minutes are, well, I'm prime. You know what I mean? Pretty much. And we know you're prime. You probably, if you're going to stay at Colorado, Prime needs to recruit high school kids, you know? For sure. Prime yeah. needs to recruit high school kids at a higher rate that he's not doing right now. But I don't think Prime's going to be at Colorado all that much longer. Um, it reminds me, every time I think of uh, Deion Sanders, we always talk about consistency. I'm fine with it. I don't have any, uh, what do you call it? I don't have any complications with him i don't have any issues with the way he runs about his business it's different it's very different than probably even i would try to do something if i were a head football coach but i'm not Deion sanders um but every time i hear something from a it's consistent but i i think of a george ironically a george Strait lyric it's called a song it's called, i've come to expect it from you and it's just a song about this woman's actions and how she carries herself and you know he's come to expect it from her. You know what I mean? So I, I've come to expect these types of things from Dion. It's a prime fest every time. <laughs> yeah, every time he gets up to the mic, you know exactly the type of person you're going to get. You know the exactly the type of answers you're going to get from him. So if that's how he wants to treat his consistency, that's fine. Then be with it. Let me address something that I think I need to address. Oh, for real. It, it is interesting that like there are a select few coaches in college football that let their media members know that they're reading what they write. Like there's, oh, there's Shane not a, Beamer's one of these. Exactly. Shane Beamer is a prime example of this. There's not a whole lot of them, I don't think. At least it's not talked about a whole lot. But there's a few of them. There's like, I'm going to let you know that I'm reading every article you put out. I caught Kirby Smart retweeting Dog Nation one night at like 1230, like past midnight. He's had a couple slip ups over He's like, oops, sorry. <laughs> Um, no way he's he, – someone else has got access to that Twitter account, right? He's not out here definitely. tweeting out happy birthday graphics. Most definitely. <laughs> you know? He he probably grabs the phone for the Go Dogs tweet. I was about to it. say, you think he does the Go Dogs tweet? He does the Go Dogs tweet because it's always late. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's never – yeah, it's never Kirby broke the news. Yeah. You know what I mean? But every once in a while, he'll be getting a spike. What is, what is man talking about? Go Dogging. Oh, prefer PWO. little PWO <laughs> mm -hmm. action. Um, but now, hey, welcome to tonight's show. We got a loaded one for you guys. Um, we got a five star study. Every once in a while, I like to do research projects with no intentions. Uh, have no idea what the hypothesis uh, going into the experiment is, but we're going to do it together. We're going to find out what it ultimately brings us in terms of knowledge. Ohio State's got me laughing out loud. I, I mean, we are coming to a point nowadays in college football I never thought I would get to. 
Um, even though I, see, I feel like we say that all the time. We're going to set the bar tonight on a former Georgia football coach that has turned head coach. And where does Oklahoma, the Oklahoma Sooners, coming into the SEC conference, where do they rank amongst, you know, the, the nation's premier programs here in the nation's premier conference? Welcome in. we got a great one for you. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button, like, subscribing, rating, and reviewing. If you're missing any portion of tonight's broadcast, it will be made available for you guys, however, wherever you catch your podcast. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to our friends over at Prize Picks. If you haven't already, sign up today. PrizePicks.com, promo code Brooks. You get 100% deposit match. That means you put up to $100, you will get matched instantly with a free $100 right there in your account. And here's the deal, man. Like, brackets are fun. Brackets are fun. But I mean, imagine the thrill of just dollars and cents going up and down with, nay, every basket. Every basket that is shot. There could be something on the line for you over at prospects.com. And if you're a fiend like me, that sounds like a good place to be this March. Prospects.com, promo code Brooks, 100% deposit match. Shout out to those guys. All right, this five-star study, boys. I'm really excited for this. I'm excited for this as a series moving through all of the positions. Um, you know, most people, most shows would probably do this in one lick. Say, all right, let's look at the five stars over the last X amount of years. I have extended this past that, okay, particularly when we get into specific positions, like tonight's position, linebacker. Linebacker is a position unlike quarterback, where quarterback, you might have five five stars in one singular class. At linebacker, you might only have one or two. So I don't, I didn't think we were going to get a large enough sample size with just that, so I've extended it to the top 100 players. Okay, if you are a linebacker in the last three classes, okay, 2021, 2022, and 2023, we think 2024 is a little bit early for any type of, uh, you know, making any statements about young players' careers. They just got there. So those three classes, 21, 22, and 2023, we looked at all of the linebackers that were ranked inside the top 100, and boys – I found some pretty interesting things. And now, again, I do this every once in a while. I, I tell the boys, I want to do a study. I, I want to go look at this thing because I, I want to find out. And I don't know what I want to find out. Honestly, I got a couple of questions that I think are going to get answered when we do this study across the board. I think, number one, we're going to find out really quickly what the hit rate is, right, at each position. Hey, this the industry as a whole is better at ranking this position than this position. God, they're awful here. You know what I mean? Like, we're going to find that out through this type of study uh what does the industry miss most on is what i'm just trying to explain to you right there we're going to find that out as well what do they hit on does it correlate with nfl hit rates i think we're going to find this out over time as well they're really good at identifying good college players but those players don't actually turn out to the nfl Ooh, some of them do maybe it's just a harder position to actually project but nonetheless i, pres I presume with every single one of these studies we're going to find out something, whether it be about the position, whether it be about the development of the position at certain schools. Like I found out in this linebacker study, there's a couple of schools that are really good at both recruiting and developing. And there's some schools that are only good at developing. And there's some schools that are good at recruiting, but bad at developing. We're going to find something out every time we do one of these, and I'm super excited to do it. So we're going to start with the linebacker class, and we're going to start with the 2021 signing class. The number one linebacker in that 2021 class was a guy by the name of Terrence Lewis. He was originally committed to Tennessee, decommitted from Tennessee, committed to Maryland. Just a flat miss. He's now at UCF. He's just, nah. -uh. That was the number one overall player and linebacker in the consensus rankings in 2021. Xavier Sori, I'm going to call that a miss. A straight up miss, right? Has not developed. We'll see what it turns into at Arkansas, but it just doesn't look good. Then we got three hits in a row. I would consider Barrett Carter an absolute tremendous hit at the linebacker position. He was ranked number 33 nationally in the 2021 signing class. That's a hit. And then you got Smile Mondon. I would consider that a hit, right? We believe he's going to be an NFL football player going to be a three-year starter uh, on the college ranks in the SEC. Jeremiah Trotter Jr. was the fifth-ranked uh, linebacker in that class. We're still inside the top 40 overall. Uh, he's an NFL football player. He's going to go on to the NFL uh, draft. Now we got some misses, right? Like Rayshon Davis committed to UC, uh, USC out of Santa Ana, California. Ten total tackles in 2023. That's a miss. Okay, Dante Lawson, I think he's been a really decent football player at Alabama. Had to sit behind a couple of guys. He's finally getting his run. Played well last year. Ethan Culvert, a top 100 player, committed to Utah. He's since portaled. Uh, Reed Carew 
okay? Started out at OSU, has since traveled to West Virginia. In 2021, boys, there was a hit rate in terms of just a decent college starter of about 50%. Half of these guys in the top 100 went on to be decent college starters, and I think half of those guys that were decent college starters are going to be NFL players. I think Barrett Carter, Smile Mondon, Trotter, uh, and Deontay Lawson play on Sundays. All agreed? I would agree with that. So about 50-50 right there just in the top 100. Okay, on to the 2022 class. All right, I think you got three hits so far. Harold Perkins, okay, Shamar James down there at Florida has looked really, really good in two seasons. Uh, And then Lander Barton is a linebacker that signed at Utah out of Salt Lake City. He got banged up, had a knee injury, but he started as a true freshman, looked like he was going to be an absolute dude, and then got hurt. So we're going to give him three hits there. Now, there's still three question marks in this class. Jalen Walker was the fourth ranked overall player cj hicks was the number one rated linebacker in that class gabe powers was the number eight linebacker in that class Jalen walker we know the reasons why you know whether or not he's been an edge rusher whether or not he's an inside off the ball linebacker he's had a hard time finding a role so i don't think it's fair to call that quite yet a miss the same thing for the ohio state kids cj hicks and gabe powers They look like they're going to be good college football players, but we haven't seen them on the field yet because Ohio State played their two, uh, you know, redshirt seniors the last couple years and Tommy Eichenberg uh, and our guy number 22 from Blessed Trinity. I always forget. Steel Chambers. Steel Chambers. That's such a great name. You'd think I would remember it. (laughs) Um, So we're going to find out about those guys. Guys, I got it. Three hits. Three questions and then two blatant misses. Jalen Sneed was the number three overall linebacker in that class, committed to Notre Dame. He had 21 total tackles in his career so far. Okay, 21 total tackles in his career. Sean Murphy was a five star, a number 72 overall player in the country in 2022, signed at Alabama, has since transferred to Florida State. I'm going to call that a miss so far. And then on to 2023, guys, this has been dynamite. They have gotten so much better in recent classes at ranking this position. Uh, Centarian Perkins at Ole Miss was a dynamite hit this year for them. Played a lot of football and played it well. Anthony Hill at Texas made instant impacts this year. We believe Raylan Wilson's going to be a guy. C.J. Allen already is a guy. Tony Rojas up at Notre Dame. Sounds like he's or excuse me, Penn State. Sounds like he's going to turn out into something. We'll find out about Drake Bowen, uh, the kid from Notre Dame. Bottom line, you're at about a 50-50 hit rate inside the top 100. But overall, this position nationally is filled out by a completely different group than guys who were even ranked close to the top 100. Most of these guys, in fact, are ranked somewhere around 450. I ran it today. According to PFF, they had a list of 10 linebackers, okay, all the way from Harold Perkins to Jeffrey Bassa, the the former safety converted to linebacker out there at Oregon. These top 10 linebackers, according to PFF, I added Smile Mondon because they're idiots and left them off the list, okay? Hmm. Those 11 linebackers who represent the top 11 linebackers in college football in 2024, their average high school consensus ranking was 437th overall. And boys, that does not include Jalen Ford, who is arguably one of the better linebackers in the sport at Texas, who was ranked 1200th coming out of high school, and Cal Halliday, who is arguably one of the best linebackers in the Big Ten at Michigan State, who is 967th out of high school just giving you a lot of raw data right there gentlemen off the top of your head what what do you what do you, what sticks out most to you 50 50 hit rate honestly doesn't surprise me that much that kind of seems to be a mark of like whenever we talk about any type of hit rate when it comes to players give me a coin flip yeah give me a coin flip on it but like nfl draft whatever you want to call it i mean that seems to be the consensus um the rankings though like for the top 11 linebackers or whatever it being in the 400s that to me is surprising do, do you think my question would be at that point like do you think it maybe is just that like linebackers aren't set as a highly precedent when it comes to recruiting them like compared to other positions so most people that live in the recruiting world in the rankings world i should say they will tell you that the rankings are an attempt to uh kind of mirror what nfl success is going to look like in the draft so what they're telling you by not having five-star running backs anymore they're very rare right is they're trying to say well they don't draft these guys up there anymore i would say that linebackers when extremely good have extremely high draft grades, right? When just an average player, most of them all go in about the same range. And I think we're kind of seeing that play out in high school, right? Got a 50-50 hit rate on the great ones coming out of high school. And then most of the quality starters 
come out of the equivalent of the fourth to seventh round, right? Yeah. The the 467th player in the country is a high school equivalent of like a fourth round draft pick, fifth round draft pick. And that's kind of where we see most of our starters in the NFL come out of the draft, if you really think about it. Some of the all pros, they're first round draft picks, they're second round draft picks. But majority of the NFL starters, I would imagine, get drafted from four to seven. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I, I never thought that the rankings did that. Looking at it just makes me feel old, man. <laughs> like just like seeing like class of 2021 where guys are already seniors. Some of them already declared for the drafts. Like I remember like that class being heavily recruited. So just to see all that go by, it's yeesh. So I, I had a couple of uh, primary takeaways, right? Um, Georgia signs a lot of these guys. Georgia also gets a lot of these guys onto the field. Even if we still have questions about them, I've seen Jalen Walker damn near lead this team in sacks. Like, I've seen Jalen Walker get onto the field. I look at schools like Ohio State and Notre Dame who have recruited this position extremely well over all three of these classes. This list is littered with Notre Dame and Ohio State commits. They can't seem to get those guys onto the field. And not even from like a a mop-up duty standpoint, most of these guys play very little, if at all, and they either transfer or in some cases like C.J. Hicks or wait until year three to even crack the lineup. I, I th- to me, what comes to mind with that discussion is, you know, the linebackers play a massive role in Georgia's defense. Like, I mean, that's your bread and butter right there. You like, you got to have two great linebackers to really like capitalize off of Georgia's defense and make the most of it. Whereas, like, if I think of Ohio State's defense, I think mm. of edge rushers or I think of the secondary. You know, they produce quite a bit of defensive backs out of there as well. So maybe it's just they're kind of more so prioritizing elsewhere on their defense. Whereas Georgia, like, they put a lot of assets into that linebacker room. I mean, I think it's just you have to look at the common denominator there in Glenn Schumann, who is one of the best coaches in all of defense of college football. He's there, and I think he's probably been the difference maker for that. Yeah, Ohio State does have really strong edge players and really good DBs, but I think that's probably because, well, I think their linebacker room doesn't match up to the equivalent of that just because they don't have a guy like Glenn Schumann. Yeah. One one school that I was impressed with just in terms of, like, even when they don't have five stars starting at the position – they've always played well is Clemson. Yeah. Clemson has recruited decently in the last couple of classes at this position and they developed guys, right? That 2021 class was massive. You signed two of the top five guys in the class and Barrett Carter and Jeremiah Trotter both play a lot of snaps for you and one's in the league now, or one's going to the league and one's coming back next year and it's the better one, Barrett Carter coming back. But then you also land Sammy Brown out of, out of Jefferson and I, I have my questions. I still do about Sammy as a football player. But when I see the, the history of success, like why can't Sammy Brown be a, a, a souped up, really, really athletic version of Skowski, the linebacker right. that they signed out of North, uh, you know, North uh, Northgate here in the state of Georgia? Like Skowski didn't make it in the league, won't make it in the leagues, probably already selling insurance somewhere already. But during his time at Clemson, was an impactful player, was on all ACC rosters Mm -hmm. at times. So even when they don't have super talented football players, they find ways to produce super talented, uh, you know, box score results. Yeah, Clemson's the team to me that seems to always get the most out of having, you know, solid college linebackers. Remember Ben Bulware from a couple years ago? Yeah. Like guys like that where it's just like excellent college linebackers, might not be the most athletic, might be limited in some areas, but – they really did get the most the cat out of guys Calhoun like that. Calhoun was really good. That war number 10? I can't remember. Specter? Specter was yeah. good. Braylon Specter was mm-hmm. really good during his college career. Didn't pan out in the league because none of those guys can run. Yeah. They won't They won't have that with Sammy Brown. No. <laughs> Sammy Brown going to go 4-5-2 <laughs> at 240 when he leaves Clemson. So, um, nah, it, it was one of the things that stood out to me. Um, but the other thing that stood out to me, particularly looking at this PFF list, right, like C.J. Taylor. That is a that is a hybrid linebacker that was a former safety, right? The Jeffrey Bossa kid from Oregon. That's a that's a former safety. Okay, the Colin Oliver kid from Oregon State or Oklahoma State that's in the top six of these rankings. That was a two hundred and five pound high school safety. You're almost better off prioritizing speed at this position and therefore recruiting big safeties to convert down towards the box at this point is what it feels like to me. If you're recruiting, like all these kids that pan out, I don't see a single one of them that are listed above 220 pounds coming out of high school. All these guys are 210. They run like deer, and we put weight on them when when they get to school. But none of these guys are super, super heavy coming out of high school. Do you think that's just the evolution of the game and where yes. the sport is right now, where there really isn't a true inside linebacker other than the mic? Like, you have to be able to run in coverage and all that and cover all 52 yards of the sideline. So I think that might be just why you're seeing that. 
Do you think that's ever going to shift back? To where you see more Ray Lewis type linebackers? Where uh, it's just, in the NFL, it is right now. If y'all ain't seen what the Baltimore Ravens are doing, yep. shit, they're going to scare some teams this year because you're going to have 220 pound Willie linebackers now in the box mm -hmm. having to take on Richard at 305 pounds as a fullback and then having to tackle the 245 pound Derrick Henry. Yeah. I would imagine if if we were going to revert back to this it would have to require some type of downfield blocking rule change. Mm -hmm. The reason the spread and the RPO is so available and so obviously the right choice in college is because of the downfield blocking rules. You get three and a half yards. In the league, you get two and a half. It sounds crazy, but that yard makes it really – I mean, it almost turns into two yards on Saturdays because guys aren't calling. If you're at four yards downfield, that pocket is – or that flag is staying in the pocket in college. It just is. So three and a half becomes four and a quarter, and two and a half stays at two and a half in the league because they, 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 they really, really – uh, kind of uh, hone in on that rule in particular. Any other takeaways from from the linebacker recruitment, just in terms of you know these five stars and highly recruited kids? It is interesting to see how the common theme is kind of Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State, in, or uh, Notre Dame sprinkled in there a little bit. Like those are the four programs that recruit the linebacker position the best. Some Penn State, yeah, uh, USC. Don't ever go there if you want to be an inside linebacker. They're 0 for 2 on this list, okay? Now, it's not a lot of sample size, but they are a dreadful 0 for 2. They are 10 tackles in his career over three years and transfer within 18 months. That's a no-go for linebackers at USC. Um, I got a good chuckle yesterday. Now, Tuesday, we came on the show when the Caden Proctor thing hit, and I surmised that that was a, a, the check done bounce type of deal. Right. All right? Because he's from Iowa. It's not like he's going to find out how much Iowa sucks after living 18 years there. It's not new to him. So the only thing that could have <laughs> changed, possibly, in my opinion, was maybe some payment structures. Now, I mentioned that that might not be the only one. And the reason I mentioned that is because I wasn't – Twitter wasn't the only one that heard the rumblings about Caleb Downs maybe being one of these as well. Okay? They, and it wasn't just Tim Fuller had cockamamie Bama fans going crazy. All right? These were – y'all were y'all heard the conversation. Y'all, we were in the room, yep. and Brooksy gets a phone call, and y'all say, did, you, did I just hear that correctly? And I'm like, yeah. Uh, Caleb Downs might have one of these situations as well where, you know – the promised salary might not have been the salary deposited in the monthly bank account statement. And when that happens, nine times out of 10 nowadays, um, hey, it's, it, you, you just renege on the offer. You just, we're gonna go on back. We're gonna go on back where we were. And as this kind of story was gaining steam, Ohio State's collective comes out with a, a very peculiar and well-timed tweet, uh, basically saying, nah, dog. We got that money in. We good. He's here all year. Super excited about the year-long deal we have with Caleb Downs. Now, I didn't stipulate year-long deal, but it basically says we're super happy to make sure Caleb Downs is, uh, you know, a member of this Ohio State roster for uh, uh, a full calendar year. I find it really weird, boys, that we have NIL collectives having to come out here and confirm the employment status of college football players, but it's that's where we are. It's definitely weird. I mean, to have a school come out and basically say, no, this guy isn't leaving us. He is getting everything that he was promised. Put that on God. Yeah. With, with, <laughs> without, without specifically saying, you know, he's getting the money he's expected, but I, I guess that's just where the era of college football is, where basically you now have to confirm or deny whether or not the rumblings of so-and-so is leaving is true because of money issues. Yeah, I guess collectives are going to be the ones that start kind of doing breaking news on Twitter. They're going to be the ones making these big announcements. You know, Iowa's collective made an announcement today on their Twitter feed, and they basically had to reaffirm that, don't worry, Caden Proctor didn't take any money from us. Like, don't worry, he didn't steal anything from us. He's going to Alabama without having taken any money from us. So the check bounced. Yeah, basically. That's basically what <laughs> so they the said. check bounced. Thank you for confirming my theories <laughs> that the check bounced. Um, now, I, I think you, you mentioned that the NIL collectives will start breaking news. There will be an Adam Schefter in college football very soon. And I, you know who it is? It's probably going to be Matt Zinitz, and that's unfortunate for me because I would totally take up the role of, yeah, call me and tell me how much money you're making, and I'll tweet it out for you. But that's going to happen. It, it'll, it'll happen very, very soon where these agents, because that's who wants the clout, the agents will start propositioning media reporters as, 
my player got this go tell the world we saw our first version of this with nico now that was the collective bragging eventually we will have these agencies coming out here and saying my player got x amount of dollars uh signed with us it's inevitable and and that will only create a job opportunity for somebody to have the breaking news on contract details of college athletes i mean didn't pete thamel kind of do that on college game day last year i can't remember what the news was but it was like all of a sudden through game day they were like breaking news we're gonna go to pete thamel and he had like i can't remember what the topic was i wish i could remember off the top of my head he broke news on a mary's mims this year mm. out of nowhere it was like none of the beat had it and all of a sudden Amarius isn't playing against Ole miss like hmm how'd you get that yeah that's very peculiar how'd you get that um because we didn't hear about it we, we found out from you Got anything? No, nah, I'm just reading through the comments and everything. But the the more and more agents play a role here, and and the more and more able and open nil discussions are allowed to be had, like they are now, um, in terms of pay for play. Eventually, all this stuff will be flat rate feed. I would imagine, hopefully, and then all the outside negotiations will be. You know, you'll have to sign NDAs on. Do you think we're ever going to get to a time where collectives and schools begin confirming numbers like this, or is it all going to be kind of hearsay based on what reporters and agents float out you know fun fact when they first told us nil was coming down the pike they insinuated that there would be you know how the NCAA has a clearing house they insinuated that nil representation would be made available at every single school where they would basically have a registrar where you would have to come in and you would state i'm getting x amount of dollars from this entity and then the school would check up on it and make sure it's good money and then register that income for you. That's what we were originally led to believe. And then Texas a and was like, how about we make a state code where we could just launder some money? <laughs> huh. And everybody's like, ooh, that's a good idea. Let's just do that. Yeah. So that's where we ended up. But originally, what you're talking about was supposed to be the case, where all this stuff was supposed to be out and open. Yeah. Like, hey, so-and-so got a Dr. Pepper deal. Congrats, Bryce Young. Not so and so gets money from such and such LLC that the collective of boosters created to basically be a shell corporation <clears throat> for money in and money out, money mm -hmm. out, which is what we have now. We have boosters giving a hundred thousand dollars to this LLC, and then that hundred thousand dollars going immediately out of that LLC to distribute amongst players every month. Right, that's what's happening. Good for them. Good for them. It's not the strategy, or at least it's not a sustainable model for the future of the sport, I do not believe. I guess I'm just wondering what is preventing this becoming a leverage point for players and agents to say like, oh, Blank has offered this player $9 million for yeah. this deal, when in reality that's a complete fallacy. So in the league, it behooves, in the National Football League, it behooves the agent to talk about how much money they got the player I don't know if it behooves anybody to be talking about how much money college players are making right now in a public sense. I think it only it only creates more questions. Hmm. Just but because the, of like shadiness of it? Or? I guess, yeah. Of, you know, I don't think we're far from things being out in the open, which I hope is where we ultimately end up. Like so-and-so makes this much. Because the players inside the, the facilities know they're 18 years old 19 years old they're talking about how much money they're making yeah and they're asking around hey how much you get how much you get how much you get so everybody kind of knows but i would like to know outside the building i think that would uh create more transparency which that's all we really care about anyways um but yeah the, the idea that the collectives out here confirming employment status was nuts it was funny but it was nuts probably won't be the last one mm -mm. For probably sure. won't be the grass is always greener quote from J.C. Latham was kind of weird, too, on Caden Proctor. Well, I didn't see that one. Yeah, they asked him. I guess he was at immediate availability this spring, and they were like, so what do you think about the Caden Proctor stuff? And he was like, well, I mean, the grass ain't always greener. I mean, literally, probably. That's funny that Iowa said the check mounts. That's classic. I also think it's interesting that some of these former Alabama players have come out and spoken about it. I think it was – Ah, uh, Clinton Dix and another um, Alabama player. Like one had the perspective of this shouldn't be celebrated that he's coming back. We shouldn't be welcoming a player like this back because you chose to leave. You didn't want to be here. And then the other one had the perspective of like, 
bro, like it, if they want to come play for our program, they should be welcomed and celebrated no matter what. So I think it's interesting that you get these like dual perspectives. I wonder, I wonder if it's kind of like that on the roster. Like if it's kind of split down the middle of like, bro, you left us. Like we don't really want you back here. And then the other half I'm sure is like, yes, please. That's still the weird thing is like, most of the older players on that roster probably aren't getting paid as much as the younger players on that roster. Definitely yeah. not. Caden Proctor is making considerably more money than the redshirt senior who just now earned a starting job or has been starting for two years at Alabama, whoever that is. Like Malachi Moore came back for a, a bunch of different years, right? That kid's probably not making near as much money as, you know, Caleb Downs was last year yeah. or Justice Haynes is or whatever, the the five-star freshman that got signed on that roster that isn't even playing. This is something that Kirby talked about yesterday in his media availability. Is like our system – or Tuesday, our system is messed up in the sense that the younger players who have not really done anything on our level are the ones occupying majority of our cap or our money distribution, whereas the older players came into this uh, world of college football where they weren't allowed to maximize, so we don't have to pay them. So do you think that, like, say I'm a f senior, I'm looking to come back for a fifth year, I enter the transfer portal, do you think that resets the market for me? Like for sure. It reset the market for JDJ this past offseason. Mm. So, yeah, I guess that kind of answers a question of maybe why you see so many older guys kind of mm -hmm. dip out of some of these good situations that you would see in like, when, why are they transferring? Well, well resetting the market a little bit. Yeah, yeah buddy wasn't getting paid. He, he got to hit the free agency to get his cash. So that's where we're at. Um, we do a set the bar around here. We look at a program. We say, hmm, what is the, the standard? What should be the bar? What, how should we set the bar for that program? Today's program is Syracuse, who has a, a, a head coach that Georgia fans listening today are very familiar with. It is Fran Brown, the defensive backs coach from the University of Georgia. And when Fran first got hired at the University of Georgia um, to be the cornerbacks coach, not the DB coach, the specific cornerbacks coach, um, like I always do when I find out about new hires, I want to ask, like, hey, who is this guy? What's he all about? All that good stuff. And one of the very first things I heard about Fran was he's a tremendous recruiter. Everybody knew that. He recruited well at Rutgers. He recruited well at Temple. He recruited well everywhere he was, right? He recruited well during his time at Georgia. Everyone knew he was a great recruiter. But the number one piece of intel that I had that I found was very, very important about this individual especially with regards to like how long he was going to be at Georgia, was the fact that he was represented when he got to the University of Georgia by a guy by the name of Jimmy Sexton. If you know anything about Jimmy Sexton, you probably learned a lot about Jimmy Sexton this past year, is that Jimmy represents 90% of SEC head football coaches. Jimmy also, at the time, only had two clients on his entire uh, client list that were not active college football head coaches, one of which, Jeff Levy, just got a head coaching job at Mississippi State, making about $6.5 million a year. The other one, Fran Brown. So when he got to Georgia, everybody was like, this guy will inevitably one day be a head football coach. We don't know when. We don't know how fast. We know eventually it will happen. Now, Fran coaches at Georgia for 18 months. He's there about 18 months. And as he's finishing up his last season at the University of Georgia, uh, Dino Cabers is fired. Is it Dino? Favors. Uh, favors. Oh, yeah. You know, Favors is fired at Syracuse. And so Fran, just being Fran Brown, decides, hey, instead of telling my agent I want to be up for this job and having my agent contact that athletic director, I'm going to call my agent and I'm going to say, hey, I want that AD's phone number and I want to call him specifically myself. I want to do the bidding for myself. And Fran's reasoning behind this was basically saying that if someone's going to go and, um, you know, advertise on my behalf for a job that I want, then it better be me. And the reason being, if I don't get the job, I have no one else to blame except for myself. So here is Fran Brown basically trying to get a head football coaching job as a position coach at a power five football program without any help of his agent and just kind of negotiating things by himself and trying to interview throughout the process by himself. Starts with a text message, hey, I want this job. Gets a phone call, seals it up immediately. Gets the head coaching job. I think it says a lot about Fran Brown. I think it says a lot about his ability to win over anybody that he wants to win over, but I also think it says a lot about his own uh, you know, self-confidence about who he thinks he is. Yeah, I remember when he talked about this on the College Game Day podcast, he, he referenced where – there was another time in his coaching career where he was up for a job. He thought he was going to get the job, 
And then they went another direction. He said he felt humiliated. He felt embarrassed that all of this information was leaked out. Like, oh, he's got this locked up. It's going to be Fran Brown. And then they didn't hire him. And he said he kind of wanted to avoid that this go around. And I'm just going to kind of do this thing on my own. Hmm. Yeah, and props to him for doing kind of doing this thing where it's I'm doing this on my own terms and not relying on anyone else. I mean, I don't think you have to do that in this day and age. You can have a good lawyer team and good agents working for you, but. Um, I'm gonna. I'm very excited to see what's gonna happen this season with I, Syracuse. I bet it was a, a like a really really different interaction for the athletic director. Probably, you get so many different agents calling you, and all of a sudden the, the actual person wants to talk to you and 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 argue, or not argue but sell himself on behalf of himself. Like that's totally different than most interactions that guy probably had. Yeah, you know? I, th- I think he said he got a phone call back within like an hour, yeah. like after he sent the text message. Shoot your shot, man. Yeah. You never know. Shoot that shot. You know? You might end up being the head coach of Syracuse making you're making three and a half million dollars a year. Yeah, I can look at it. Four up. million dollars a year. Let's see. He said that uh when they put the contract in front of him, he looked at the athletic director like, You're about to pay me this much money? Huh. <laughs> now I don't know if that was him just kind of being uh, you know, coy. Estimated three to four. So yeah, yeah like three and a half. Like three and a half million dollars. All right, so here let's let's do this. Let's set the bar for Syracuse. Now, I think the initial bar is to be competitive, like in every single football yeah. game that you have. That was my initial bar, and then I looked at the schedule. Easy. This schedule is very manageable. There's it's got to be the easiest in the country, in my opinion. They, they should start five and zero. Yeah. I mean, honestly, they play Ohio at home, Georgia Tech at home, Stanford at home, Holy Cross at home, and then they go on the road to UNLV. I mean, who's the hardest team on this schedule? Miami? Is it Miami? Yeah, that's what I'm like. On the total schedule, Miami. Miami's or the NC worst State? game. Let's, let, let, before NC we State. skip too far ahead, let's, let's read this off. I gave you the first five. Then it's at North Carolina State, at Pitt, Virginia Tech, at Boston College, at Cal, UConn, Miami. I went through this, and I gave them five automatic wins. They should beat Ohio. They should beat Stanford. They should beat a Holy Cross. They should beat UNLV, and they should beat UConn. That's five wins. Now – I gave them a loss against Miami just to give it That's to them. That's fine. Yeah. Now, let's go through the rest of them. I think they could pull one out of two of all these, right? Georgia Tech, North Carolina State. You can beat one of those They teams. should go one for two, right? Pitt, Virginia Tech. You should beat Virginia Tech. You should get one of those two, yeah. right? Pitt, Virginia Tech. Boston College, Cal. Both road games. Ooh. I feel like if you were going to slip up on one, it's probably the trip to Cal, maybe. But you should probably get one of those two football Absolutely. teams. So if I just went through their 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 schedule and gave you one out of every two games that we think are a coin toss, dude, that's eight wins. Yeah. That's eight wins at Syracuse in year one. Now, uh, the, the chat's pointing out some good things. Virginia Tech's got a returning quarterback. Let's not just count teams yeah, out. I mean, like, there, there, are some, there are some teams here that are a little bit more of a uh, – like Syracuse will be an underdog in those situations. Yeah. Well, but, they, they beat the shit out of them last year too. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are five easy wins, and then there is a reasonable situation where they could win eight games. I think your baseline for year one is go 500, make a bowl. Yeah. That's what happened last year. You you were six and six going to that they ball have game. A considerably better roster than mm-hmm. they did last Correct. year. Correct, specifically on the offensive side of the ball, and that's that was your weakest link last year. They ranked ninety fifth in and offensive you have a defensive scoring. Head coach, you yeah, got a defensive head coach. Yeah, defense last year was fifty seventh in scoring, but they got a super old offense too. I mean, every single one of their offensive linemen is a transfer, except for the left tackle. He's a he's a returning from what I saw. So it's a lot of age on that roster. And they put a lot of assets into that offense, a specific like quarterback and wide receiver. So I think you're going to see steps forward there. So by by those means alone, you should be a better football team. I think town alone, they should be able to win six games. Like you said, there's there's five should be wins on there. So we're going to set the bar. At se- I think you should set the bar at seven. Um... Bro, if I mean it's it's a down, it's a it's a consider, it is a loss, it is a bad year if you only win two out of these games: Georgia Tech, NC State, Pitt, Virginia Tech, Boston College, Cal, and Miami. If you only win two out of those, that is a bad year for Syracuse and Fran Brown. Yeah. You did not meet expectations, in my opinion. I think the absolute worst scenario for Syracuse is they pull a Colorado and they win the first five, and then they just pull a stinker the rest of those schedules. Just win like one or two out of the next yeah, six. Yeah, and you completely become irrelevant after that. I mean, they didn't beat Virginia Tech the last year. They mm-hmm. didn't beat Boston College. They didn't beat Georgia Tech. So, I mean, they've, they've lost to teams that they could beat before. And you have to remember, like, for as talented as this roster is, for as easy as this schedule is, 
you do have a guy in there that has no head coaching experience and is in his first head coaching, like first year as a head coach. So you so, want I mean, to be fair and say B500. Yeah, there's there's going to be growing pains. There's going to be times when you look at me like, oh, damn, Syracuse did not look good today. Or maybe Fran Brown didn't manage the game the best he could have. That's that's what you're going to get first year coaching. Every first year coach had that. Nick Saban had it. Kirby Smart had it. Jim Harbaugh had it. Like some of the top coaches in college football. So that's why I say just go, just do what you did last year. Do what you did last year with the promise of things are going to get better, with the prospect of, hey, yeah, the team wasn't great this year just because it's Syracuse, but there are we're getting better players in, and the outlook is much better moving forward. And, I mean, something that he'll have to do if things go accordingly is that if you do start your season 5-0, and you're going to have to kind of reel your team back in. Uh-huh. Because, I mean, if you have immediate success like that for a program that's kind of struggled over the years, you're going to have to kind of set the expe- like reset the expectation almost after that stretch. Reel your guys back in and be like, we still got a whole other half of college football ahead of us that we have to prepare for. And it only gets more difficult down the stretch. It's not a great quarterback either. Nope. Not a great one. That. I was going to say, like, how, where would you rank him amongst the ACC quarterbacks? I don't even know. Yeah, that. that's I couldn't. I don't even know the ACC slate like that, to be yeah, honest with you. Man. I don't either. Who is it again? Oh, uh, it's Kyle McCord. Yeah, I was going to say it's Kyle McCord. It's Honda it? Accord. Um, so we'll see about that. I mean, the the rest of the roster in terms of their playmakers is, is all Power 5 retreads, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty much. It's like half it's of a bunch Georgia's. Of transfers. It's like Georgia's backup receiver unit and then a bunch of transfer linemen. Yeah. He, he did he did pretty well. I, I will say this. One thing I've noticed about his recruiting is, at least here in this state, okay, he's taking chances on guys that other programs are like, Ew, I don't know about that, mm-hmm. right, that have high upside. I don't want to name one specific player, but he took a specific player here from the state of Georgia last year that early on in the cycle was like a top 25 player. Yeah. Okay, and as the cycle progressed, he didn't get less talented he just couldn't find his way onto the field at any of the four schools that he went to. So everybody was like, oh, this probably isn't something we need to do. Syracuse was like, shit, we'll take him. And uh, he, he talked about that, actually. Of like, They asked him, what do you want to kind of be known for on the recruiting stage? And he mentioned, like, if anything for us, like what we need to become is become a place where if nobody else was a shot on you, then we're going to bring you here and we're going to develop you and make people regret that they didn't take a chance on you. Like, we want to take chances on those kids. Yeah. That's, I mean – it's Syracuse, so you you have to have a very different model, right? You can't go out here and say, "Well, I'm I'm going to recruit against Ohio State up here in yeah. the north." No, the hell you're not. I don't care who you are, right? I don't care how good of a recruiter you are, Fran Brown. You're not going to battle the big boys. But like you're saying, if you got a highway speed guy that's testing out of the charts, but maybe coach can't get him to show up to weights on time, so they're not starting him. Well. Maybe once he runs out of options, his ass going to get to wait some time at Syracuse. So we might want to take that chance. So I, I think, me personally, I think the bar is seven wins. I don't think you can you can fire the last guy, have all this momentum on the trail, and then do the same exact thing that the last guy did. I know we can talk about it being Syracuse football, but they didn't pay this man and hire this man like they just want to be Syracuse football. Eventually, you have to do better, and you've hired someone to achieve better. That's what they did. I'm I'm fine with seven wins. I think that's a great bar for them. I st- I still think six is more. F- I, I I mean we're talking about like absolute baseline. Like if you like mm-hmm. you have to get to this. I think they could very well go six and six this year, and people would be like, okay, first year into Fran Brown. I get it. Like seven seven wins is like a successful season, but six is like the bare minimum. Like you have to hit that. All right, set the bar at seven. We'll set it there. Um, let's disagree some more. Where does Oklahoma rank in the SEC? And and I got I got some I got some thoughts here, right? I was thinking about it today, and what made me think about it is how many people are shitting on Brett Venables as a football <laughs> coach. To be honest with you, don't nobody like Mans. Like, everybody thinks Mans is a bad bad head coach. But anyways, I mean, like to outside the top ten in the SEC is a little bit of a stretch. But like when you look at it, you're like, no, nah, no, he's not. He's not in that top ten with the rest of these guys. But where is Oklahoma? Where is the university? Where is the football program with regards to like coming into this conference and and melding with the SEC? Where are they at in terms of the pick of the litter? And I went, I went, I went looking through it, guys. Did you know that Oklahoma for the last two decades has never had a, re- a roster that ranked outside of the top ten in terms of composite talent? <laughs> I believe it. Never. But here's the other thing. They've never had a coach this bad in the last two decades. It was Stoops. Yeah. And then Stoops was like, I got to get out of here so I can hand it over to Lincoln Riley. 
And then Lincoln Riley was like, I got to get to USC. And that was Venables. And Venables is not anything that the last two guys were. And I know there's a transition period here. And I know there's a change in a turnover or whatever. Lincoln Riley was a born winner. The moment he stepped into, you got the keys to this Ferrari, it was, all right, a couple of Heisman winners. I'm going to the Rose Bowl. Georgia got me, right? We're dipping out to USC. But there was never a moment where Lincoln Riley wasn't like, one of the top five to 10 coaches in college football at Oklahoma. The questions about Lincoln didn't arise until he got to USC. Mm-hmm. When he was there, he was a, a, a stamped winner. Now you have this Venable guys in here, guy in here that nobody really knows or feels confident about what they are. So he, here's my question to you guys. What stops Oklahoma from coming into this conference, showing initial competence, and then within six or seven years, falling down to the mediocre of the pack and being a team that every once in a while is competent based off their recruiting rankings, a la, I don't know, Missouri. Missouri came into this conference and like immediately showed competence. They were you know, winning games, playing for SEC championship games. And now it's taken almost a decade since then uh-huh. before they found a head football coach that not only wins at a high rate but recruits at a high rate and, and gets the state legislation to pass laws for him to win at a high rate and do things like this. And now Missouri looks like a football team who is competent within the conference and every so often can put a roster together to potentially compete for the conference. What stops Oklahoma from being one of these in a couple of years? Because if you just look at the landscape of the conference right now, you got Georgia, you got Bama, you got Texas, and you got LSU in this kind of group of perennial we knows. We know those teams are going to be good for the foreseeable future. They're always good for the foreseeable future, right? Ten wins minimum, okay? And then the rest of them are kind of competing. Like Oklahoma's in this bunch with teams like Auburn, Florida, Missouri, Tennessee. I don't feel comfortable about putting them in that upper echelon of teams. Do y'all? No, they, they definitely don't belong in the upper echelon. But I mean, and I mean, there is nothing stopping them from becoming like exactly what you're saying. But that's but, crazy because for two decades, top ten, top ten rosters, they were, their five hour radius is really good. They get northern Louisiana, they get northern Texas, they get uh, all the way up to Missouri, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. They get all of Kansas. They get all, all the JUCOs in Kansas. They get all this proximity to talent. But when you compare it to this conference, their five-hour radius doesn't stack up to LSU's. Nope. Their five-hour radius doesn't stack up to Alabama. No. Their five-hour radius doesn't stack up to Texas, Texas a and nope. Georgia, Tennessee, Florida. Like, What stops them from being Missouri in a couple of years? Five years, six years. Doing exactly what they did last year, where you get a win against Texas and you don't capitalize off of it. Like, that's a definition of being a mediocre team or like being a middle of the pack team, especially in the SEC. Like, any of these teams that you kind of think of, like, they might get one. They might nip someone in the butt, like, midway through the season. It's like, oh, that's the one that they needed. Now they just got to close it out, but then they never really close it out and it never turns into anything. And that's exactly what would hold them back from ever being in this top echelon of SEC teams is if you continue to do what you did in year two in the SEC, then you're only going to be represented and seen as a middle of the pack team. I mean, what's going to stop them from becoming this is one, the outer pieces have to kind of fall in your favor. Like, Kalen DeBoer can't be nearly as good or, I, I mean, as successful as Nick. He's not going to be as successful as Nick Saban was, but you know what I mean. Like, uh, Lane Kiffin can't be super successful at Ole Miss like it is. Hugh Freeze can't figure out getting Auburn together. Like, Oklahoma can be a very talented middle-of-the-road team in the SEC, an, an upper echelon team in the SEC, which, by the way, you don't have to be the top dog in the SEC anymore. You can be the fourth, fifth, even sixth best team and still make a postseason run now. So I think that that's probably going to be one of their saving graces is that you don't have to be top two, top three. You can just be fourth and fifth and still be playoff teams and national championship caliber. So we know that the a lot of talent acquisition nowadays is best based off of your salary cap. Mm-hmm. It's just the reality of the sport. And the other thing that we know is that on three does the best job, in my opinion, than the only company that's even attempting to of establishing the kind of value of each of these NIL collectives and I was just curious, where does Oklahoma stand in their spending budget? 17th, 17th in the country uh, behind schools like South Carolina, Washington, uh, Georgia, obviously, Michigan, Auburn, um, Texas Tech, okay, West Virginia, Ole Miss, a lot, of, a lot of SEC programs obviously ahead of them. But football means a lot in the state of Oklahoma. It's about all they have, really. I mean, they have some Oklahoma City Thunder stuff. Um, 
That's about it. Yeah. No professional football team. Tornadoes. No, okay. So with regards to where do people put their football money, it's Oklahoma and then it's nothing else. And here we are, 17th. So I I just I've always grown up with Oklahoma being a perennial powerhouse. Everywhere I went. My dad's from Colorado. He grew up an Oklahoma Sooner fan because of Bosworth. All right. So like in his adulthood, changed to an Oklahoma fan. Oklahoma has always been important since I have known and loved college football. I just don't know if we can guarantee that's the case in 10 years. Mm. But like the chat says, super dependent upon quarterback play. Like you said, still won 10 games or 11 games last year in the Big 12. It's the Big 12. They got past Texas, but it's the Big 12. This is not no longer the Big 12. What do you think happens to Venables if Dylan Gabriel goes out and puts up ridiculous numbers at and Oregon? Jackson Arnold sucks. Yeah, gonna look at you real weird. Gonna look at you real weird. But he could probably look back at his boosters just as weird. Yeah, he didn't make that decision on his own. They got Jackson Arnold in there, and they want to see Jackson Arnold. So there was gonna be no we're losing Jackson Arnold to the portal because you want to see one more year of Dylan Gabriel. You know that that's just not happening nowadays. Yeah. With with, with roster acquisitions and, and where the money is allocated. For sure. All right. So we all we all kind of agree. Not in the upper echelon. Probably about five or six, and they might hold that way for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's gonna be more dependent on. What does Brian Kelly end up doing at LSU? Mm-hmm. What does Kalen DeBoer do at Alabama? Does Lane Kiffin keep Ole Miss in this kind of fringe, outside looking in of the top upper echelons of the teams? I mean, it, it's all very dependent. What does Sark do in his fourth year? Like, is Sark going to keep the momentum going, or was last year kind of a one-off thing? So I think that's going to – it all depends on what happens around them. Sark seems nfl to me. You think? I think. Mean, like a – like a, Let's I'm, see. yeah, I'm gonna hang out here five years, eight years, make a hundred million dollars coaching college football, and then I'm gonna go to the NFL and win a Super Bowl or try. I was gonna say like he seems like maybe the type of guy that let's see if I can hitch my wagon off Arch Manning real quick, and yeah. then if that pans out, I think I'm good. Yeah, let me let me find out. That's what I think Sark might be doing because hmm. Lincoln Lincoln's days of being able to be the next NFL great head coach are probably yeah. gone, kind of dying out. Yeah, kind of dying out now. Teams start sniffing around Sarkeesian offering him 12, 14, 13 mm-hmm. million dollars a year to come coach the Jags, whoever. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to that local hour. Hit that thing. Welcome in to Talk the Dog, the show where we find a bone to pick and a take to give. These are not hot takes. These is dog takes. Can I talk that dog? Let's shut up and grab some tape. Hey, how you doing? Welcome back. Uh, we got a whole other hour. It is our local hour. We got a jam-packed one for you. The 2025 SEC schedule was announced. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, a former Georgia commit committed to Clemson, and I think he's a tremendous football player, so we're going to talk about that. What happened with Tay Harris? Uh, we're going to give you the details there. And then we have a give me three. We're going to give you three of the biggest storylines from not only spring practice, but maybe what's to come in spring practice. Okay, so I don't know. I don't know if I gave you full details on that one, boys. My bad. We have a player of the day. We're gonna take a look at Faison Brandon, a, lot, uh, a quarterback just recently got a uh, an offer from the University of Georgia, 2026 cat out of Grimsley. Take a look at him, and then I have a just a, a random rant that I want to bring you about Georgia's defense because. You know, as a Georgia insider, I get asked a lot of questions from a lot of my readers and a lot of the subscribers and a lot of you guys. And I think if we just took some time to talk about this today, maybe I can avoid answering the same old question over and over again. So maybe we'll address that and solve that today. But the biggest news on today's show, guys, is obviously the 2025 schedule that came down. Now, we didn't get actual dates but we did get home and aways. We got home opponents and away opponents. And you'll notice some commonality here. It's basically, it's not basically, it is. It's the 2024 SEC slate just flip-flopped. If it was a home game in 24, it's a road game in 25, which means in 2025, your home SEC games will be 
Alabama, Kentucky, Ole Miss, and Texas. Your road games will be Auburn, Mississippi State, Tennessee, obviously Florida, the neutral site game as well. You'll be the road team in that football game, so you'll get to call the coin toss. That's Mm -hmm. nice. But other than that, um, initial takeaways, boys. I know the very first question I got asked over and over and over again, why is it the same teams? Well, here is the quote from the SEC commissioner. We continue to monitor changes across college sports as they relate to future scheduling. Continuing with our current format for the 2025 season provides additional time to understand the impact of the changes happening around us as we determine the appropriate long-term plan for SEC football scheduling. Long-term short, we don't know. We don't know what this bitch going to look like in a year and a half, two years. So we just going to sit tight and do the easy thing, which is just play the same teams. Yeah, to me that read as we're expecting to add more teams into our conference. And so we don't want to go ahead and flip-flop the schedule again and then have to do a complete reset again when those teams come to our conference. So we're just going to play the same teams. That way if 2026 rolls around and we are adding more teams in the mix, we can have an easier transition into those teams coming in the mix. Boy, I would tell you what, it is a bad time to be getting rid of your season tickets at the University of Georgia because you're going to make a lick on the resale market here. Yeah, that 2025 scores. Being a student in 2025 is going to be elite. I mean, you're getting Georgia versus Alabama in – Athens, that's happened twice in the last 20 years. Hey, Leland, I don't know if you watch the show, buddy, but if you do, by 2025, can I get three credentials, my boy? Please, please, my boy. By 2025, I think we have earned the right to do that. If not, Mm. I might stage a mutiny. Huh? I mean, the storylines on this schedule alone could be insane. I mean, you think about Arch Manning coming to Georgia to play in Sanford Stadium, his first year starting. That's a heck of a storyline. Getting to go play out in the Rose Bowl, obviously against UCLA. Like this, honestly, might be the greatest schedule ever, in my opinion. Mm. It's got potential for it for sure. It's gonna have a lot of top twenty-five opponents. You would imagine all of those home games will be massive, massive ranked opponents. Um, What is the biggest game in that? Is it Arch in Athens? Is it Brock Vandergriff returning to Athens for the first That's time? That's a good storyline, too. That's a good one. Uh, you got Bama in year two with with mm. Kalen DeBoer and Austin Mack, you would assume, is the QB coming into town at 6'6". It depends on how 2024 goes, I think. If, if Alabama comes out this upcoming year and they're not the same and they win nine games, Texas is the answer. And, if, and especially if Texas, you know, makes a deep playoff run or wins the whole damn thing. Like, obviously, Texas is going to be the marquee matchup there. But it's all just going to depend on how this season shapes out. Like, I mean, no one would have thought in 2021 that the 2022 Tennessee match would be the number one matchup that season. So, it just it all depends on what happens. It is funny that Georgia's going to play Texas twice, and they're already going to have played them more than they have Texas A&M in its mm-hmm. entirety. I'm going to be honest. That that maroon, I'm good. I'm good on ever seeing a stadium full of maroon and khaki, which is what Kyle Field is. Kyle Field is filled with nothing but maroon, white, and khaki, and people kissing each other when they score touchdowns. That's what Bama and Arkansas are. They though. still do that. Of course. Sure. At Texas A&M, do you still kiss the person next to you, male or female, when you score a touchdown? I don't think it's – I don't know if it's male or female. I don't know. Female. COVID may have changed I don't that. Know, man. I don't know I don't if know. it's male or female, but I think they're Sounds probably Sounds like another still pandemic there. happening. Yeah, uh, probably. Here, here we go, pandemic. Well, you know, Kyle, Kyle Phil was the one that Dan Mullen was out here talking about. Well, maybe we'll just pack the swamp next week because ain't no way that was 20% capacity. They were oh, loud. Yeah. We lost game. Boo, boo, boo. I'm sad shit. 2020 Dan Mullen is – needs a documentary. People forgot how insane that season I was didn't. for him. I didn't forget it all. <laughs> I will never forget the tomfoolery. That went down with Dan Mullen. Starting a fight at halftime of the Missouri game and then coming out in a Darth Vader costume. Was Just a- peak, peak jackassery right there. I loved it. Oh, and then acting like he didn't see the shoe throw. Like, well, I didn't, I didn't actually see it. I don't know what happened. So, yeah. like, come on, man. To be fair, it was foggy as shit that day. It, it was. was. Foggy as shit that <laughs> it day. was. What were we talking about? We're talking about the Georgia Which 2025 game be schedule. The biggest? Oh, yeah, no, it's, it's going to be a loaded one. Um, I'd probably take the Arch in Athens. Yeah. That's going to be huge. Yeah, I mean, it'll be the first time. When's the last time Texas came to Athens? I don't know if it's ever happened. I'll look it up. Probably in the 40s. Yeah. It, it's it's got to be somewhere buried. Way Frank deep. Sinkwich was out there getting nasty. <laughs> Bless you. <clears throat> By the way, if the damn audio don't sound just beautiful tonight, I don't know what to do to you. Well, I, I think we dialed her up tonight, boys. Oh, yeah. I don't see no complaints. You know, it's funny. We see all the complaints. Don't see the compliments. You know, mm. don't don't never hear the compliments on the audio. Everybody just whine, 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 whine. We do it right. 
No pats on the back, so we'll give them to ourselves. So last time Georgia played Texas was obviously in 2020, 2018. Yeah. They've never played at home. They've played four neutral site games, one away game. So all bowl games, yeah. obviously. Interesting. Is Georgia it? only won one of them. <laughs> I Isn't mean that's interesting. <laughs> this to me. Do you think that Georgia and Ole Miss are going to ignite a rivalry? This no. is three years in a row that you're going to play one another. Oh, that's right. Three years in a row that both teams are probably going to be ranked or they should be ranked. Huh. Might get a rivalry go between these two, in my opinion. I I think that uh, Kiffin and Nick, or Kiffin and uh, Kirby have a brotherly rivalry. I think they dislike each other, kind of like you two do. Or kind of like me we and my brother do. We don't dislike I, each other. I don't know how you guys are. I was I was competitive with my brother. We talked mm. a lot of shit. Not a lot of I love you bros between me and my big brother. Mm. It was a lot of, uh, you know, I don't, stuff. I don't think it's that. Even that spicy of a rivalry. I think Kiffin and Kirby kind of really get along together. The reason that made me think this was this year during – and you really had to dig oh. deep for this or you had to watch the Film God Network's film breakdown of the football game. But the first touchdown Kiffin scores – He's like outside the numbers, MF and Kirby, like, look at that fucking shit. Like, we're about to run this shit up on your ass. He's like pointing across the sidelines doing the thing. And then it gets called back for a hold. Mm -hmm. And Kirby walks to the same portion of the field and is doing the same shit to Kiffin on the other side. Like, you know, you ain't shit, whatever you're saying. But he was giving him the, yeah. the, the business. There's, so yeah, I think I think there's a. It wasn't. It didn't feel to me like the Beamer stuff does. The Beamer no. stuff feels like genuine dislike. This seems like I don't like you because you're. I love you. Kind mm -hmm. of Just deal. straight shit talking. Yeah. yeah, that's why I think it could become a fun rivalry. Like if both head coaches remain there for like the foreseeable future and like they continue to be like regulars on each other's schedule, I think it could be a fun little rivalry that ignites. Ole Miss has got to beat Georgia for to be a rivalry. <laughs> Fair like I mean, like if if it's gonna be this, and every year Georgia comes in, yeah, and wins I guess by it two could scores. easily turn into like Ole Miss versus Alabama was for a while, but Ole Miss got Alabama. Or like Georgia versus Clemson is about to turn into, yeah, yeah. something like like there has to be like back and forth for it to be a rivalry. I, I I don't I think like it's gonna be interesting every year. Like oh you know, Lane Kiffin's got a good team this year, but if Georgia keeps stomping and people aren't gonna want to tune in as much. <laughs> hmm. Bama in year two. Okay, the board is gonna be interesting. You get Bama this year too, but yeah, Bama at home should be interesting. Offense should look totally different by then. You got Ryan Williams year two, yeah, out there at Alabama. It should, it should feel different in year two for them once they actually have their quarterback in. I still, when I see you take a transfer from old buddy from Mississippi State, what's his name? Quarterback Will oh, Rogers. Will Rogers. When I, see, when I see you selectively take Will Rogers while you're the head coach at Washington. It kind of tells me what you want at quarterback, right? Yeah, all the options in the world, I would imagine, they selected Will Rogers. They didn't select a Jalen Milrow type is what I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. Right? They selected the antithesis of Will uh, 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 Jalen Milrow in the portal when he had a pick of his litter. Decision when, maker, yeah, not super athletic. Yeah, when he gets handed a roster, it's got Jalen Milrow on it. Now we hear all these positive things, I would imagine, about Jalen Milrow. And that's great. Maybe he can turn that into a but and, and maximize Jalen Milrow's skill set. But when he had his choice, he was not choosing these types. In fact, it's the opposite. Austin Mack was his guy. They leveraged a bunch in 2024's recruiting class at Washington, had him reclass out of 2025 into 2024, or maybe it's out of 2024 into 2023, whatever it was. They had Austin Mack get there as soon as possible. It's their guy. He's 6'6", he's long, he's virtually immobile, and he's got a chooch attached to his shoulder. It's the opposite of Milrow. Okay, so I, I'm very curious to see what they, what they actually do with that, knowing that based off his history of, at the position, that is not what he looks for. Hmm. He doesn't care about athleticism. They care about decision-making. He signed Michael Penix. He wanted Michael Penix. That is not Jalen Milrow. No. So, no, he's not. A sidetrack there. It would be very interesting to see what happens. But um, speaking of what happened, um, Tay Harris. Tay Harris is a six-foot, I would say, 190-ish pound nickel corner safety hybrid defensive back, okay, out of Cedartown High School. He ran 438 recently at the Under Armour uh, series down in Orlando. Um, and I'm just going to give you a timeline here. He was offered by the University of Georgia and Fran Brown June 1st of 2023. 
He got that offer two days after camping at the University of Georgia. Showed up, camped, two days later, got an offer. 18 days after receiving that offer from Fran Brown in the University of Georgia, he committed to the University of Georgia. That was June 19th, 2023. Okay, flash forward to January of this year. He decommitted from the University of Georgia, January 21st. He committed to Clemson this week after kind of reopening his recruitment process, going through the process, visiting several SEC schools, and ultimately choosing to play his college football at uh, Clemson. Again, he's from Cedartown. He runs 438. He is a verifiable dude. Okay, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that Tay Harris is going to be a really, really good college football player whether it's at safety whether it's a nickel whether it's at corner this guy's going to go to clemson and be really really good this was not your typical clemson versus georgia recruiting battle all right i'm here to tell you they lost sammy brown they wanted sammy brown but sammy brown was like four on their board their board last year linebacker was nuts okay it was really really good it's like three or four on their board some of the other recruiting battles where they've come into this state clemson has and taken kids they weren't necessarily takes at the University of Georgia. This was not the case. This should not be the case here. Tay Harris is 100% undoubtedly should be a take at the University of Georgia. So how in the hell? How in the hell does this cat end up at Clemson? How do they let this guy fall through the cracks? And the only thing I can think of, boys, is that when he committed to the University of Georgia, since then they've had a complete change at the cornerback position, since then, he's potentially gone through a complete change position-wise, right? They committed him as a true corner. Maybe he wants to play safety. Maybe he wants to play nickel. And even if he did at Georgia, oh, by the way, that position cha- group has had tremendous amount of turnover since you know his commitment and his recruitment process has really blossomed. So I think when you look at like how does this guy get you know missed, how do they let this fall through the cracks, his initial decommitment, the first thing he said was, I just hadn't heard from them. And, well, why haven't you heard from them? They've had a tremendous amount of turnover. So I just think this is an unfortunate situation where this should be a Georgia Bulldog. They're going to let this kid go to Clemson. This kid's going to end up going to Clemson, and he's going to be a damn good football player. I mean, Clemson's a good place to go for defensive backs, too. I mean, they've done a pretty good job of developing those types of players. Um, I mean – Obviously, it plays a role in two of like who you have on your roster. Maybe I mean, you get a KJ Bolden if you want to play safety that's coming in and he's already kind of figuring things out. You lose Malachi Starks by the time you get on campus, but I mean, there's a lot of bodies that they added into that room in both rooms and a lot of good bodies. So maybe it, like too crowded played a little bit of a role in it, but I think a lot of change is really what um, it boils down to. Yeah, I think this is kind of the unfortunate thing you get when you try to, what Kirby Smart says, is stack talent. Mm. Like when you take so much talent in, some of it's going to fall through or some of it's going to filter out and go elsewhere, not only because, you know, maybe they saw the room were like, I don't want to come here or, like you said, stop getting attention as much. But that's just one of the things that happens. I don't think this is a indictment on Georgia football as a program as a whole. I mean, they, they have plenty of talented players. I think it's just going to be one of those things where – Sometimes you can't take everyone. I'm just trying to look back through their classes just to kind of like Vic Burley, Georgia wanted, okay? He's from the state of Georgia. They wanted to go after him. Stephylon Green, he had a Georgia offer. They kind of faded on that one towards the end. Zach Owens from the state of Georgia, zero Georgia offer there. Actually, he got one very, very early. They faded because he ended up being over 370 pounds by the time he got out of high school. A.J. Hoffler uh, from Woodward Academy, no Georgia offer there. All right, so you you go through these lists. Brandon Strozier, the cat out of St. Francis, right here in Alpharetta, Georgia, no offer from the University of Georgia. Shelton Lewis, a corner out of Stockbridge, no offer from University of Georgia. Rob Billings, no offer from the University of Georgia. D. Creighton, zero offer from the University of Georgia. Avion Terrell, A.J. Terrell's little brother, no offer from the University of Georgia. So they come into this state and they offer and pull off kids that Georgia didn't necessarily want. Tay Harris is not the case. Mm. Interesting. I wonder. I wonder what like the, again going back to this discussion of hit rate. I wonder what Clemson's hit rate is with a lot of those. Hmm. Uh, in previous classes, not very high. Hmm. Okay, twenty twenty three class. I still. I still think jury's not out. Jury is not out yeah. yet. But if you go back and look at some of these other classes, most of the guys like Miles Oliver out of Douglas County. I don't think that's panned out for them. Um, that's a corner. I remember uh, watching him and evaluating him out of DC. I don't think it's panned. Um, let me go back into this 2021 class and I'll give you a real full 
in-depth kind of breakdown of these Georgia guys because most of these guys have already finished their careers or are working to finish their careers. Barrett Carter's panned out for them. Yeah. Um, now they've kind of tried to go back to the well here in Gwinnett County, and they signed Jamal Anderson in 2023. I don't know if that's going to pan out, but we'll see. Uh, let's see here. More Georgia kids. Nate Wiggins, obviously a hit for them mm -hmm. out of uh, Westlake. Uh, Phil Moffa was a good football player out of Grayson for them, but an injury kind yeah. of history. He's still on the team, isn't he? He still is. Injury history kind of got them. Bubba Chandler, quarterback out of North Oconee, didn't pan out. I think he ended up being a baseball player. I don't think he actually <laughs> plays for them uh, on the football team. Really good baseball player, though. Dakari Collins didn't pan out. The wide receiver out of Westlake didn't happen for them. So it's kind of like one out of three, maybe one out of four. Looks like Avion Terrell is going to be a hit. Hmm. You know, he he played well as a true freshman last year at corner, but you know, it's it's touch and go with what they do. But it very nowadays it almost looks like I've I've said this before on this channel, it almost looks like what uh Will Muschamp was doing when he was at South Carolina. Hmm. Will Muschamp would come inside of two eighty five and he would say, All right, who's the best high school football player that George is not recruiting? I'm taking that guy. Yeah. And, it, and again, not a terrible strategy. No, no not, not a all. terrible strategy at all. It just didn't work out uh, for for Muschamp up there at SC. Was um, Tay Harris the first commit for the twenty twenty five class? I believe so. I feel like isn't and this the a last the last and only guy to go wire to wire is David Daniel back in twenty twenty. Yeah. Since then, your first commit, you're for, you're guaranteed to decommit. I mean, it it feels like it's almost impossible for it, like. You get a lot of love when you first commit or when you're in the recruiting process, but then like once you commit, it kind of feels like it's inevitable that eventually that love is going to kind of die off a little bit because you got to shift some focus over to other guys that you're recruiting. I mean, you got to put a lot of effort in that to make sure that you wrap up the class. Not saying, of course, that these players aren't worthy of receiving check-ins from their coaches or whatnot, but especially when you're going through a coaching change. And when you, when you commit early, man, you got so much time to listen to other people. Think. Uh -huh. You know? And get picked off by other people. I, I'm a prime example. If Tay Harris, I mean, he was the first commit right after him was Elias Williams, yeah. the tight end out of Camden. I'm here to tell you right now, they don't feel like rosy about that one, that it's just guaranteed he's going to sign on the dotted line come December. They don't feel great. They feel good. But they're still like, ooh, watch out, Florida, Florida State. Still taking visits, right? Camden County kid, like, you're not guaranteed – to, to have these guys when they're early pops like that. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, it could be the Georgia curse. Very well could be Georgia curse. Again, that's crazy since David Daniel, dude. Yeah. 2020. That's four classes, almost five. It'll be five this year. It's five classes of kids that were first in, guaranteed out. Jeez. That's weird. I think it was a running back in the 2024 class. Uh, Webb, Trayon Webb, oh, yeah, ended up going yeah, yeah. To, yeah. to Florida. Well, that's two classes ago. Yeah, so either way, but it ends up like that. Um, give me three. Let's do it. Three of the biggest headlines, okay, from Georgia's spring practice. Now, you can do this. Current headlines, things that have arisen that are big talking points. It can be storylines that you think are going to continue to arise as camp develops. Nonetheless, the three things that you think we are talking most about, I'll start first. Um, number three for me, and I even titled some of these like headline grabbers, mm. right? Like this one, transfer transition. A lot of transfers transitioning onto this offense, particularly. Defensively, Ooh. haven't heard a lot about these cats, right? Yeah. Xavier McLeod, Jake Pope. Seem like they're kind of buried down the depth chart. Offensively, however, these guys are going to have to play a role. Trevor Etienne's going to have to play a role. Colby Young, going to have to play a role. Okay, London Humphreys might be a little bit more of a projectionable, kind of like a, a maybe year two pop as a transfer. But these guys having to make transitions are having to do it really, really quickly. And most of them are going to have to play a major role. So that's my first one. Uh, and then number two, uh, didn't really title this one correctly. I Give me some time. I might be able to get to it. But um, the freshmen in this class need to hit it and hit it earlier than ever before. I think nowadays, particularly at schools like Georgia, when you're not dependent upon the transfer portal as much as some other schools are, this year a little bit higher a uh, number of transfers than normal. Normally it's about three or four. This year it's seven. That's a lot more than normal. But normally it's about three or four, which means you're really, really dependent upon your high school classes and nowadays with the guys going out via the transfer portal and the guys getting drafted, you're turning over about a third of your roster every single year. This year, I think it's 35% of their roster that's having to be replaced with either freshmen or early, early uh, transfer players. Those freshmen better hit 
Like you, you better have guys that are able to play as true freshmen nowadays in college football. And I think they've done a really, really good job of that. It seems like early dividends or early results are telling us that these guys are who we thought they were coming out of high school, particularly those higher rated kids, uh, whether it be uh, KJ Bolden all the way down to like on that recruiting list of Daniel Calhoun. If you look at the consensus rankings, oh, uh, excuse me, Jaden Riddell's ranked lower than. Daniel Calhoun, don't know how, based off what we're hearing so far. But that list of like the top seven or eight guys that they've signed in 2024, those guys sound like they're hits. And then Battle at Star? Mm. Well, Battle Star Galactica going on. Huh. You know? Not a Star Wars guy. Am not, but there is a war going on at Star, Georgia. I don't think Battle Star Galactica is Star Wars. What is that? I think that's a video. It's its own entity, I think. Yeah, something else. I thought the Battle Star Galactica was the evil being in Star Wars. Huh? I'm not going to nerd out on here, but <laughs> I just know that you're wrong. Either way, Battle of Star, didn't expect one, right? There was a five-star coming into this that everybody was talking about, myself included. Joan L. Aguero wanted to see it, wanted to see it, wanted to see it. Sounds like Kyron Jones and Ja'Cory Thomas, I'm not saying are pushing him for this position, but it's not clear-cut one and two. It sounds like there's a clear-cut 1A, 1B, and a two yeah. in this room right now. And that, to me, is a massive storyline. Those are three great storylines. Hey, that boy, Brooksy, give him three. <laughs> Who's up next? I can go next. My first one that I have is the quarterback position has kind of become a storyline throughout the spring. I mean, we've gotten some conversation about Carson Beck a little bit. You know, he he went to the podium and discussed like what he wants to see improvement upon himself. Kirby Smart kind of touched on it a little bit. But we're hearing a lot of things about how is Puglisi performing in his first couple of practices. Like, how's that going? A lot of good things coming out. But hey, still a freshman. Gunnar Stockton seeing some improvement from year uh, from over the year from last year to this year now a little bit. But also still kind of getting their bearings a little bit. So I think the quarterback room has kind of become a storyline a little bit throughout this spring. Uh, the second one that I have is the freshman linebackers. I mean, you specifically have raved about them a lot, and that's kind of that's always a good thing to hear. If that's a storyline for Georgia, if you're getting these freshmen in and they're being a, talked about over your starters for this next year, man, that that's just a great outlook for you. From a physical standpoint, it looks like three Croy Walkers standing <laughs> over there. Huh? It's Jeez. nuts. It's crazy. I want to see this. And they're, and they're in similar numbers. 16, 18, and 19. They're just standing over Those there. are interesting linebackers. They look like it. freaks. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I, I want to see that in person. I, the way you talk about it, I just want to see it for my own self. I almost want to pay somebody for practice tape. I just want Because you're not going to see them. Yeah. We're not going to see those kids play. Justin Williams will play this year. Chris Cole will play this year. We're not going to see a ton of them. But I bet they – oh, man, I bet they do some freaky shit in practice. Because mm -hmm. right now, they're probably just see ball, get ball, which oh. probably puts them in really bad positions where their athleticism has to get rid of it. And I bet I bet they do wild they stuff. They just figure it out. Yeah, their body's just like, poof. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, whoa, whoa. Yeah, so I bet it's really fun to watch practice tape right now with those guys. Oh, yeah, I can only imagine. And my third one, I mean, Roderick Robinson, it's, it's arguably the biggest headline of yeah. the entire spring. I mean, the way that he's been performing in practice and – Basically, how he's untackleable in space. I've I've been writing about this, and I don't mean to diminish the stuff that we're hearing. Yeah, but it is thud speed. Yeah, right. It's thud speed, and you're not allowed to hit. You're a smaller linebacker. I bet you ever, rarely ever hit a back that was bigger than you in his chest. Never. Ever. Never. Always attacking the thigh board. Have to. Always. So like. Yeah, Rod, Rod's going to sound great this spring. And I, 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 I let everybody know it's going to happen. So, like, first of all, he's taking a lot of ones reps. Secondly, ain't nobody going to tackle that some bitch right now. Ain't nobody no. going to hit that dude from his waist up. Ain't nobody. And if they do, it's going to look exactly like it looked in practice observations the other day. Some DB was like, you know what? I'm going to go stick my face in the fan. <laughs> and just whoop, ah, just exploded. Just absolutely got obliterated. And that's that's what's going to happen because you can't hit him from his waist down. So, yeah, he sh he better be. He better be a bitch to tackle. Right I guess now. the bigger thing is more so maybe the GPS stuff that Correct. we've kind of heard about. That's the Correct. bigger picture that's, for him. That's the real talking point. Yeah. yeah. Is, damn, this guy's a whole hell of a lot more athletic and explosive yeah. than we thought. So, yeah, those are my three. Hey, that boy Jay Will, give him three. What do you got for us? All right, the first one I went with is Jared Wilson is kind of, I don't want to say surprised people, mm. but – He's gotten a lot of buzz around him in this offseason. I know with losing Cedric Van Praan, everyone was kind of like, oh, you know, we're losing a lot with this offense. And you are. You're losing a leader. You're losing someone who really understands the offense. You're using a three, losing a three-year starter. Like, that's always a big deal. 
But it sounds like Jared Wilson is more than talented enough to take over this position and do it so in an adequate way that Cedric Van Pran did. So I think that's kind of a story that's getting some traction here. Uh, my second one is Colby Young hasn't, again, hasn't surprised people. I don't want to say surprised because that means you expect less of him. But he's kind of come in and people have said, wow, you know, he's a lot better than we gave him credit for. Or yeah. he's he's kind of giving us wow things. He could be a guy come the fall, which I don't think that was a name that was really getting floated out three months ago. I know, I know one thing about him. There is no way in hell they thought he was that big on film. Right. Because I'm telling you, I know y'all have seen photos. Mm -hmm. But the reason everybody was raving about the photos because in person he feels broader he feels even bigger than he looks in photos like yeah he, he is one of the biggest humans on their roster Hell from yeah. a physical just like look at that like he is he looks like michael williams god honest to god i mean like in person he's got really thin lowers like really thin lowers but from his waist up he looks like michael williams mm. damn and then my third one, I, I hate doing this, but I think it was probably the biggest story we've had of spring so far. Pierce Sperlin going yeah. down, that sucks. So I think that's kind of one that was a big storyline to talk about. I hate that for him. I thought it was interesting. You mentioned Jerry Wilson. I thought it was interesting for Kirby to kind of like, bro, we haven't, you haven't seen this guy play on Saturdays like a lot, uh -huh. but you've seen so much in practice that you say something along the lines of, I want the world, I'm excited for the world to see this guy. Yeah. He's seen so much in practice that he told the media in front of cameras about a player that who has never started a football game that he is excited for the world to see how talented this human is. I haven't heard him talk about people who haven't done anything for him like that. No, you, you don't, don't hear very often. You don't hear him give compliments no. like that that often. Like, Guy's doing all, all right. Yeah, he's doing good. He's got a lot of work to do. Didn't have this. Like It's almost like he does that to tamper their, to make their heads I'm smaller. glad you guys are talking well about him kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Like when, when, some, when you have Kirby Smart come out and saying, like, I can't wait for you all to see this guy, like, that's a big deal. But it is interesting that, like, when we talked to Sed on here, he, he kind of said the same, said very similar things about Jared. And then a couple days later, Kirby Smart's out here saying the same thing. So, too, now, obviously, your teammate, he's not going to bash his own teammates and say, like, oh, boy, buckle up. It's going to be a bumpy ride. <laughs> but, I mean, two credible and reliable sources that have seen this up close on a daily basis for the last couple of years have now said very similar things of, like, we're ready for everybody to see what this guy is capable of. You know who knew? Who? This guy. I wish I wish I would have clipped it. I had to go back and find it, find it. Cause it was in a it was in like a class overview. And I remember getting like physically perturbed on air about how lowly ranked this guy mm. was. I think I do remember that. Jared Wilson was the invention of a my guy. Mm. I was like, you know what? I'm so angry about the industry missing so bad on this freaking kid that I'm just going to stamp him. He, you know what? He's mine. And that's how my guys got started. Look at Jared there. Wilson. And now he's Georgia's starting center. I, ho I, I guarantee you, and I don't – I had fun watching Sed because I could tell Sed was the smartest human on, human on the field. You could just see it. It was obvious. He was never in the wrong spot. And we got him on film. He – took way more blame than you could ever imagine for a football player who had no business taking blame for things. But that's just who he was. I, I guarantee you I watched Jared Wilson with the same lore and jealousy that I watched Trav or Jason Kelsey with. Mm. I watched Jason Kelsey play football, and I'm like, damn, I wish somebody would have let me play center like that. You know? Yeah. And I guarantee I feel the same way about Jared Wilson. Because Jared Wilson is the SEC equivalent of what I was. I was a six foot, and he's six, two and a half, six three. I was an undersized, underweight, plus athlete at the position. That's exactly what his, but he's a plus, plus athlete at the position. So, super excited to watch it. It's going to be really, really fun. We done with the storylines? You got any more? I'm good. That's it. All right, let's move on to player of the day, Faison Brandon. Okay. Um, or should we do this rant first, since we're in a ranting mood? It's up to you. Let's do this rant first. They'll give you an opportunity to put the film up on the board. It's already up there, baby. The film's already up on the board? Oh, yeah. All right, let's just go to the board then, and we'll do the rant afterwards, okay? Might be a short night tonight. Come on, it's you okay ain't going to catch me lacking like that. Hey, that's my boy right there. That's my boy right there. Um, hey, shouts out to the audio equipment team. Oh, shouts out to these, uh, these Jays, too. Here's the deal about these Jays. Uh, the guy that sold them to me is actually Cedric's uncle. Oh. Yeah. 
kept it in the family. He runs a little resale shop over at the mall. Um, what's up? In Georgia? Yeah. He uh he put me on to game here. Threes and fours. All right, if y'all are sneakerheads at home, listen to me now. I'm going to put you on game. Jordan's threes and fours. And I would even go uh, maybe the 13s as well. Basically, if they're big and bulky, size down at full size. I'm normally a 12 and a half. These are 11 and a half. So there you go. Put y'all on game right quick. I will store that information away. No, you won't. All right, let's watch this phase on Brandon. I think of that when I'm buying my next pair of J's. All right, so phase on Brandon. A little backstory here. Just came down to Georgia. Okay, his uh, teammate Bryce Davis is a 2025 uh, edge rusher. Okay, Bryce, Bryce in the range. This kid, they they met with him. They talked to him. They didn't get to see him throw, but they've seen the tape. Obviously, they've evaluated him in person, having sent guys up to Grimsley multiple times um, in the last several years. They've seen this guy throw in person, but they hadn't really had him on campus to kind of feel him, get a, 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 a real true understanding for who he is, offered him immediately. Mm. Like, all right, we like this cat a lot. They were extremely impressed both with the individual that he is and his general frame. I, I don't hear a lot of sources calling me, telling me about quarterbacks. Like, dude, you just you just got to feel him. You just got to get around him and feel him. You got to see how big this cat is. You got to see what he, you, you know, what his measurables look like just in person. So they were extremely impressed. Didn't even have to see him really throw it on campus to offer him after a visit, which is normally how this works. This is how this worked with Puglisi. Puglisi came down on campus, threw for them, got an offer. This kid came down to campus, talked with them, watched football with them, and got an offer. So now let's watch the tape, right? Mm. Let's watch the tape here. Um, I'm going to be honest. All I gathered from the tape is, my God, this guy's a really, really efficient mover. These stadiums at Grimsley are really, really big. So the film is really, really far away. I was having this conversation with a scout the other day. Film does not lie, except for a quarterback. I have to see these guys throw in person for this very reason. This ball's not, I'm going to tell you right now, guys, this ball's not going to look lively on tape. But I guarantee you it does in person because these stadiums are huge that this cat's playing in. So if you're watching it, do, try not to just look at it and say, you know, what, what does that ball look like? Judge more about body patterns and, and, and ball placement more so than anything else. Like, oh, yeah, that ball looks good. That ball's right Jeez. hash, 40 yards outside number. Like that ball's a two ball too, thrown with some some pace here. We're going to see the athleticism pop here in just a second, I believe. But um, yeah. That that mm. that is a flick, son. This is modern the way mechanics. He flipped his hips on that. Yeah, he he just kept the feet in the ground and and rotated his lowers. Okay, boom. Jeez. Okay, so the feet are the feet and hips are this way, but he's going to clear that right hip and fire it towards the ball right here. This is a quick flick. I love how he stops uh, stops the momentum. Mm. Okay, you'll never see him rotate fully. You mean, yeah, you'll never see his body rotate all the way around. That front side will slam, or that back side will slam onto that front side. I got a ball in here somewhere, I'm sure. Or are they all in the car? I got the Ray Lewis ball. We'll show it in here. Draw, here you huh? see the athleticism. Big, long dude, He's man. He's got good getaways. Man. Yeah, bro, and he moves really, really fluidly. We're going to have to talk about the sock swag, but, you know, that's for a, a discussion for a different day. I kind of like it. There's four verts. You like the short sock swag? I kind of like no shows in the cleats. I kind of mess with it. Yeah, you're also a Marlon Humphrey fan. <laughs> um, all right, so okay. let's talk. Just let's talk about uh, what I'm talking about with his mechanics here. You're never going to see him over rotate his body. All right, everything is going to stop on that front left side. All right, boom, left hand strong right there by his chin at all times. I like it. I like it a lot. What are you seeing, Kirby? He's mechanically super sound. Yeah. And I mean, the accuracy in his balls, it, it perfectly displays that. Like, he sets his feet on almost every throw, even when he's rolling out. Like, here, watch this. Watching, you can see it like the buffer allowed it to show that he's just sitting down right there. That ball's hammered. Ball's from the 50 to the goal line. Across. So, he's running a post back from right to left. I mean, that ball traveled yeah. 50 yards 50 in the air. 50 yards in the air on a line. You know what? And he's, he's big, tall, and long, and it doesn't feel elongated. What are the, what are the measurables on him? 6'2"? I, I, I think he's 6'3 and a half. Yeah. Well, you look up his 24-7 sports. On tape, standing next to his teammates, he looks 6'3 and a half, about 200 pounds. Now, I don't like see me. a lot of throwing over the middle, <clears throat> which isn't necessarily a problem. I think you might get one here. 
Bill, he's got single high safety. No, he's taking no, off. Yeah, on he's that. taking off. We'll he's put, listed put at on, 6'4", 175. 6'4", 175. I guarantee you he's added some weight this offseason. I bet he's closer about buck eighty five, buck ninety. I guarantee you Robert Reynolds is chatting us up right now, telling us everything about the kid. Six four one ninety one is what Robert says. Yeah, so he, he even had it down to the singular pounds. I said about he's six three and a half. He's bigger than pounds. he looks then. Yeah, he, he's well now. This I mean, this is probably a cat that's putting on a tremendous amount of weight really, really quickly. That's a Don. bitch of a ball. Don. My God. They run a lot of empty, it looks like. Yeah. So I mean you're gonna get a lot of hash throws, but Okay. Oh, he's going to redirect this cat. Did you see him on a yep. scramble jump, point him up the sideline? Come yep. on, where the, where the that, buffer he's at, dog? That scene. Is this a tough? Oh, he threw the out. <laughs> he throws with good touch, too. Yeah. Like that ball right there. I mean, he's four yards open, but that's going to end up in the bread basket, I bet. What's up with these buffering, dude? I think it's because we have every March Madness game on in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That's on me. All right. I've seen enough. Y'all seen enough? Yeah. He's like, a really good football player. What, now, what class is he? He's 2026. Okay. So okay. He's... And 2026 also has that cat from uh, from Tennessee that's in it as well. Will you, he, you're on his 24-7 page? Mm -hmm. Will you look at the quarterback rankings and give me the name of Buddy that's in 2026 class that's the number one quarterback for the state of Tennessee? Um, he's got a QB name. Jared Curtis. Yeah, Jared Curtis. Jared Curtis is a guy too now. Um I get I get very very much so plus athlete Dylan Riola vibes from Jared Curtis. Someone dropped a crystal ball for him to Georgia. So yeah, a while back that's been in there for a fat minute. Um, that that's the board though. You would imagine it, it's it's Curtis and then it's our guy Faison. Mm. Um, and they're two different, two very different football players. I, I shouldn't say Riola vibes. I get very Puglisi ish vibes from uh from the Curtis cat, Ooh. except he's a five star. He's He's Puglisi tape in Riola's uh, hype train. That's what that is. But, I mean, he just plays in Tennessee. It's it's very weird. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that kid's going to go to UT. He's not a UT quarterback. UT quarterbacks look just like George McIntyre. They look just like Joe Milton. They look just like Nico Amalieva. Uh, they look just like Hendon Hooker. 6'5 six, 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 plus, long arms, big arms. That's what they want. All right. But, I mean, I think the Curtis kid is a, a pro-style QB to a T, a modern pro-style QB, 6'3", 220, almost built like a catcher. Yeah. You know what Ooh. I mean? That's what they want. They want, they want catcher frames, 6'3", 220. Mm. It's like an H-back tight end with a chooch on him. I was <laughs> going to say like a third baseman more. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Like modern-day third basements are kind of built like that. Mm. Maybe a little less chunkier. Yeah. But the catcher, catch a little thick. Catcher, catcher's a good saying. one. I'm saying, I, I, I want, I, Georgia quarterbacks got to be a little thick. Yeah. They have to be. They always have been. What was the last real thin Georgia quarterback? Dwan Mathis? Yeah, Dwan Mathis probably. That's it. I mean, Stetson, Jacob Eason. Stetson in 2020 was pretty, pretty Eason small. Eason wasn't like that real thin, though. I remember uh, Eason being pretty thin. Stetson was pretty small in 2020. I don't, I don't remember him being like that thin, though. Stetson is just, that's the, the stature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He got he got he got a little, little he got sauce. Thicker. He yeah, got he got, he got into the sauce uh, into his sixth year. Hmm. But no, nah, I, I like Faison. I like the twenty twenty six class in general. I think it will end up uh, depending on what happens with that twenty twenty five class, though. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, but they won't be taking class off. Do you Georgia think Georgia will take a kid in twenty twenty five, and I promise you right now, if there is any any quarterback worth a shit in the portal this spring, they're gonna take that cat too. Yeah. What do, you got? do you think we're going to get to a point where just the way the roster plays out now, where someone takes a spot, you're going to have transfers out, obviously, that George is going to be in a cycle of taking two guys a year, whether it be one in recruiting and one in the portal or two in the port or two in recruiting? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all just getting to that number of four. Yeah. You know, but whether or not they take two kids in high school, I, I would avoid that unless the second kid is a developmental play and he mm -hmm. knows it. Mm -hmm. Right, like this idea that they're going to take Julian Lewis and Ryan Zollers in 2025, you're asking for problems. Right, you're just asking for problems. Why even do it? Because we recruit the best. What? Well, get over yourself a little bit. Okay, you're opening yourself for an exit. That's all you're doing. And I, I don't, I don't. As much as they want to control narratives, why would they open themselves to a negative narrative like that? 
you know because yeah. one of those kids is going to leave especially in the uh the way that your fan base reacts to the quarterback decisions that you've made yeah. thus far exactly. i mean there are still people that hammer that georgia would have more natties if justin Fields started or that they should have went with jt daniels you know i i figured i figured stetson bennett winning not one but two national titles would have kind of impeded that it did for a while you know mythology because you know, Stetson isn't on the roster unless Justin Fields leaves. Correct. Yep. Everyone knows that by now. Like, I've, I would figure they would just let that one go. But no, they, don't. They, they won't. Even now. I mean, a guy just got traded for a, a washing machine. <laughs> Damn. You know? Yeah. <laughs> got traded for the dishwasher, bro. Damn. <laughs> like, shit. <laughs> Couldn't even. They, they, had to get, they had to give him the dishwasher with Justin Fields. The fact that we live in a world where Desmond Ritter had more of a market value than Justin Fields is wild. 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 That is crazy. Where were we at? You've got a rant to give. Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. like rants. You've got a rant to give. Let's go back to the board. Oh, we're going to the board. All right. The reason we're going to the board is I want to write some names here. So give me some epic pen here. Let's get the good stuff going. All right. So Georgia, if you look on our lads today, which is my preferred, our lads is my preferred uh, kind of depth chart checker. Uh, it kind of lets me know what the opponents that I don't study or get paid to cover kind of identify themselves as. And if you look at Georgia, and if you talk to anybody who talks Georgia football, most of them will say Georgia is listed as a 3-4 football team. Right? They have a Jack and they have a Sam. But the reality of the situation is they are a 4-2-5 football team. They always have been, or at least they have been since about 2019. Since they really started starting Jordan Davis and playing him in that mint 4-2-5, they've become a nickel-based football team, which means they always have five defensive backs on the field. So no matter what, the discussion at Georgia starts with five DBs. It starts with a free safety, okay? It starts with a strong safety. They don't call them that. They just call left. And right, ooh, LR. They call them left and right safeties. Okay, they don't flip flop. They used to. They would flip flop J.R. Reed and Richard because one of them couldn't really play, you know, center field safety. But you guess who that one was? Um, they play a left corner and they play a right corner. Okay, and then as everyone knows, they play a star. All right, you can call this guy whatever you want. Uh, in the NFL nowadays, it's Kyle Hamilton. They play more of a big nickel. Uh, used to, they would play a cover nickel. He'd be the fifth corner. Uh, it'd be think more like Kenny Moore. Okay. Nowadays, every team's dependent. Every team's special. Some people play Sam Stars, where they play outside linebacker like Clemson at this position. Clemson plays Barrett Carter at this spot. Gets him out in space. They play a lot of zone. Georgia does not. Georgia's more of a, a man football team, a zone match football team, right? So this is our base shell. This is no matter what, what we're going to start out of at the University of Georgia from now on. Now, we also know at the University of Georgia, you're going to play two interior defensive linemen, right, at all times. And we also know you're going to play a Mike and a Will at all times. Schumann's two boys are going to be on the field. We know this, right? The nose tackle Used to is Jordan Davis. Nowadays, it looks like an amalgamation of people, right? Nazir Stackhouse is the starter. He looks nothing like Jordan Davis. Ja Jarrett's his backup. He kind of looks like Jordan Davis. And then Kristen Miller would be somewhere in the mix when he gets back from his meniscus injury as well. He's a limited participant this spring, but he's in the mix, all right? So those are kind of your nose tackles. They kind of look like big D tackles nowadays. Don't really look like big nose tackles like Jordan Davis because there's only one of those, all right? But this defensive tackle, think Jalen Carter, think Warren Brinson, think Devontae Wyatt, um, think uh, uh, Jordan Hall nowadays, think Xavier McLeod nowadays for the University of Georgia, think Jordan Thomas in the future at the University mm -hmm. of Georgia. So these two guys are always going to be on the field. They're going to be in a variety of a zero technique for the, the uh, nose tackle all the way to perhaps maybe a four eye for this defensive tackle, but nine times out of ten, he's going to live in that three tech. Now, the whole purpose of tonight's discussion is to talk about the defensive end position and the jack position at the University of Georgia. Because nowadays, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think we even need to label them. I just think we need to talk about them as edge rushers because there's so many bodies now available at this position, right, defensive end, and this position, the jack, which I'm going to get rid of the star position. I'm going to put that big J right there. Now, used to, in years past, let's take it all the way back to 2020. In 2020, 
Trayvon Walker was on the bench, and do we know who was starting at the defensive end position? That would be Aziz Ojolari. That would be the Jack position. Malik we, Herring. Malik ah. Herring. Malik Herring, number 10, was starting at this defensive end position. I don't quite know for a fact, but Google Malik Herring's NFL combine measurables. Or he would tore a knee, so give me his NFL listing. I guarantee you Aziz, uh, Malik Herring's about 6'3", 280 pounds. Okay, that's what I'm going to guess right now. So that was this. I thought he was lighter than that. Nah, he'd be a big heavy guy, actually, believe it or not. 6'3", 275. The guy pretty good at his job, isn't he? All right, so over here, back then, we had this over here. We had this 6'3", 280-pound body, all right, over here. And over here, you had Aziz Ojolari. If you were to give me Aziz Ojolari's NFL combine measurements, I would venture to say Aziz Ojolari is about 6'3", and a quarter, 248. Okay, that was this body. We had 6'3-ish, okay, 248. All right, and there was a very large difference between 6'2", 249. 6'2", 249. That was this body style at this jack position, all right? That's how it used to be molded, guys. This defensive end, real big, almost like a big athletic three-tech, right? We won't play him here, we'll play with four-eye. Handle them double teams. All right, let this mic run free. All right, but you handle those double teams. That was this mold. This mold was 6'3", 280. Think Trayvon Walker. Okay, think our guy Malik Herring. Before that, it was lead better, right? Mm. All right, think of these body types. Yeah, John. All right, think of these body types. Now, go over to this jack position. Okay, for years, you were recruiting Nolan Smiths. Even up to Chaz Chambliss. Guess what Chaz Chambliss is? Chaz Chambliss about 6'2", 3 quarters, about 245. All right, that, what, that's what the roster used to look like. And I can understand why, yeah, we want to differentiate between that guy's a jack and that guy's a defensive end. Well, I'm going to be honest with you, boys and girls, that's not what the roster looks like anymore. Okay, the roster has a variety of these edge defenders, okay, particularly with Michael Williams coming over into the quote-unquote jack room. All right, so now you got Michael, okay, now you got Damon, okay, now you got Sam and Pemba, all right, and you got Gabe Harris, okay, and you got Chaz Chambliss, in no particular order, by the way, guys, okay, who am I missing here on this list, don't let me forget anybody, okay, you got Quintavious Johnson, okay, as a freshman in here, all right, now, let's go through these lists, and just talk about these human beings, oh, and TID, Okay, you got TID down here as well. TID, about 6'5", about 280, as big as they come. He plays true defensive end, super freak athlete, though. Okay, Michael, about 6'5", about 265. Okay, Damon, about 6'5", about 240 now. Okay, Sam and Pimba, 6'3", about 250 now. Okay, Gabe Harris, 6'5", I think he's listed at 245 right now at the University of Georgia. Chaz Chambliss, okay, we're back into that 6'2 range, 249, but we told you, he's an old head. He's grandfathered into this class in this discussion. Quintavious Johnson, 6'5", he's 260 pounds right now at the University of Georgia. These body types start to look a whole hell of a lot similar to one another, are they not? Yes. Sure are. These body types are all going to be on the field at the same time, are they not? Yes. Is there any reason why we should be talking about defensive ends or jacks, or should we just talk about edge position players at the University of Georgia? Just edge position Uniformity players. is what I vote the for. The only thing yeah. that would deviate it is role responsibility. But Correct. That's And you, when I asked Chaz, I, I didn't ask him this specific question. But when I asked Chaz about, you know, playing Jack, playing defensive end at Georgia, do you know what, his, you know what he said the main primary difference is? The Jack stands up. Mm. That's it. Because here's the deal. When you're playing defensive end, all right, or you're lined up as a defensive end with your hand in the dirt, and now all of a sudden they motion, and you have to stand up and flex out. Well, guess what? You just became a Jack, and the other guy just became a defensive end. So why not just recruit a whole bunch of really, really talented bodies that look physically identical to one another and have eight of them <laughs> have eight of them have seven or eight of them and just rotate fresh bodies in and don't have to worry about whether or not we're calling guy jack or they're calling him a sam or call him a defensive end whatever play the role you know play the role right there on that specific snap and oh by the way you know there's this guy Jalen walker who on third down gets mixed into this rotation as well okay and he looks a whole hell of a lot more like this body type the old body type mm -hmm. but he can still rush 
So I, I just wanted to go through this exercise because I really don't think it matters. Like, for example, this guy, Chas Chambliss, I guarantee you he's going to play early down Jack. First and 10, second and three, third and ones. Chas Chambliss is going to be on the field. Third and 18, guess who's not going to be on the field? Chas Chambliss is not going to be on the field. Guess who is? Michael's going to be on the field. Damon's going to be on the field. Okay, Sam and Pimba's going to be on the field. And then probably Xavier McLeod as the three tech or the shade who's got a really high upside ceiling as a, a pass rusher. Bottom line, I don't think you need to get so caught up on who's playing this, who's playing that. Where's Jalen Walker at in the mix? Where's this? Where's that? Guys, positional value on singular uh, situations. Right, third and seven, obvious passing down. Let's get our best rush assets on the field. Okay, we have a package, whatever it's called, rabbit. We got one for this this group of uh, collection of athletes. We got one for this collection of athletes. Right, this week we like this package. We like so and so versus such and such matchup. Whatever it is, the whole purpose is to be as deep as humanly possible, and that's exactly what they are. Mm. I like it. I think that's certainly an easier way to build up depth because I feel like over the past couple of years, like especially once Nolan Smith got out of there, there were some questions about like not exactly a whole lot of names on this list that we know about or that we are sure about just yet coming into this season. Whereas now you got a whole bunch of them that can play the same position essentially and do the same things. And by the way, the University of Georgia plays a bunch of teams who get the ball the hell out of their hand mm. as fast as possible talked about this on this channel for a long time about how hey hey man sack numbers can be a little bit distorted when you're looking at georgia specifically later in the year they start picking up more and more sacks because teams to beat them have to hold on to the football more and more right they have to hold on to it longer to drive the ball down the field more often and uh when you play offenses that are getting the ball out of their hands quickly the only way to impact those passes without getting home, right, without getting a sack, is to deflect those passes, to, to cloud those passing windows, to cloud those passing lanes. The best way to do that is to get more and more length. So over the last several classes, you have seen them prioritize more and more and more the length of athletes. Okay, they, I, they might. Sam and Pimba was the last one to do it, but Sam and Pimba is a very special athlete. Okay, he's the last one they've signed that's under six foot five. Look at it. They sign long, long dudes nowadays at that position, both edge and defensive end. Mm. So there you go. Great explanation. Very beneficial information. I think you're just brown nosing me a little bit, but that's okay. Well, no, I mean, I think, I mean, it's especially considering the conversations we've had in Discord as of yeah. late. I mean, it's, I mean, just again, I, I, I hope that clarifies things where early downs know that who is on the field they trust to stop the run. In between downs, they're going to do a combination of both. Second and five, they're going to do a combination of both, right? And then on third and long, you're going to get a specific, unique pass rush set that they've always Jaylen run out there. Walker. Yeah, Jalen Walker going to be out there. All right, that is our show for tonight and for the week. Appreciate you being here. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button on your way out. I love you.